Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
folks, today is Wednesday, September 6, 2023. Coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The Georgia 19 in the Fulton County Georgia election interference case have pleaded not guilty and have waived their arraignments. Also, a couple of folks, they wanted to have their cases separated. Judge is like, nah, not gonna happen. And they're not moving to federal court either. We'll tell you all of the relevance. The federal contempt trial of former Trump advisor Peter Navarro started today. He continues to get heckled by a particular protester. Oh, I love her. I got to play her latest video. The Michigan cop who shot a black Congolese immigrant in the back of the head is begging the state's appe appeals court to dismiss his second degree murder charge. DNA frees a black New York man who spent almost 50 years in prison for a rape he did not commit. Plus, Amanda Seals has a new docu-series called In Amanda We Trust. She'll stop by to tell us all about her new project. And in tonight's TED Talk, Isaac Hayes III talks about fan base, but also he's gonna give us a lesson on streaming as well. He is the son of Isaac Hayes. A lot of folk don't quite understand the music business. He does, because he still controls his dad's publishing. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best belief, he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Not a single defendant in the Georgia election. Rico appeared in court today in the first televised hearing after grand jury indicted 19 of them last month, including Donald Trump. A Fulton County prosecutor said that a joint trial for all 19 defendants in Georgia will take about four months, and they want to call about 150 witnesses. Prosecutors want to try the case as one. In today's court hearing, attorneys argued over whether to sever the cases against attorney Kenneth Chesbro and attorney Sidney Powell. Last month, uh, the judge in the case uh, scheduled Chesbro's trial to begin in October following a proposal from Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis. Now, Willis wants all 19 defendants involved in the case to face trial in October, but the judge, McAfee, only expedited Chesbro's case after Trump's attorney indicated and he objected to the proposed timeline. Now, McAfee denied the motion to sever either Chesbro or Powell's case. All right, folks, let's talk about this with our panel. Robert Patillo is the host, People, Passion, Politics, News and Talk 1380, WAOK out of Atlanta. Rebecca Carruthers, Vice President, Fair Election Center, Washington, D.C. A. Scott Bolden, that's Aloysius Scott Bolden, attorney, former chair of the National Bar Association Political Action Committee, uh, attorney out of D.C. Glad to have all three of you here. Robert, you're there uh, in Atlanta. So, all right, uh, walk us through this. The judge said, look, I don't know if we can sit here and try all 19 of these people beginning in October, and it's going to take four months. It, yeah, this is going to be one of the more complicated parts of the case. I know that everyone is used to law and order where the whole thing's wrapped up after, you know, like a tight 30 or 60 minutes and everything is done. But in these large RICO cases, uh, and I use the example of the Young Thug YSL case, you know, that case has been in jury selection for 18 months. Uh, and therefore, the, the idea of this getting tried by October is kind whoa, of... Whoa, 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 People who may have missed that. Jury selection alone has gone on for 18 months? Exactly. Just in the, in the YSL case, because of the number of, of motions, the number of defendants, but also just trying to seat a jury, uh, they've been trying to do that for 18 months. And that case isn't even close to going to trial, and that's a far smaller case uh, than this Trump indictment. So what's going on with Cheeseboro and Powell uh, is that both of them have asked for what's called a speedy trial. So um, a speedy trial motion, you have to bring that case to trial within that, uh, that same term of court. So the term of court goes about two months. 
months. So if the indictments come down in late August, then that case has to go to trial uh, by October. The uh, uh, In this case, the other defendants, such as Trump and maybe the other uh, Giuliani, Meadows, et cetera, they don't want to go to trial that fast. And thus, you're having these motions to sever on this question of whether or not we're going to have 19 individual trials or we're going to have one massive 19 person trial. Now, both of those situations present uh, various benefits and detriments. If you're going to have one giant 19 person trial, well, then uh, it makes it easier on witnesses because they can all come in one time for one trial. It makes it easier on uh, the court system to be able to get everything done at one point in time. However, that one trial is probably going to stretch out over the course of about two years uh, versus having 19 separate four, you know, four, four and a half month trials. But then you're going to have to bring in the same witnesses in some of these cases 19 separate times to testify. You're going to have to take up years of the court's time. Um, the Fulton County's court and district attorney's office was already at a breaking point with regards to their caseload and the ability to move these cases through uh, and cases getting lost in the system, people being locked in Rice Street in pretrial detention for three, four, five years. Uh, that's an entire different situation. So the, the, the logistics of this is really what's being argued about right now. And I'm not sure how the judge is going to come down on this because this is just that first salvo of motions that are going to come because every single client has their due process rights. Every single client or, or uh, defendant has the right to uh, their pretrial motions. So it's going to be a kind of a bear of a case to get through. It's going to be interesting to see how the judge comes out in these decisions. Scott, uh, the judge made clear that uh, Chesbro and Powell's cases cannot be separated. Uh, they're trying all they can to separate, move to federal court, uh, all type of legal maneuvers. Your thoughts on really what, what took place today in court? Well, the, uh, the judge denied the motion to sever, which was the right thing to do. Uh, what's interesting is he didn't sever their cases. So um, I had, actually I had a question for Robert. Does that mean they're just going to try these cases separately in groups of four or five or as they become available? I mean, Trump obviously wants to wait until forever land, and that's not going to happen. But you could have separate trials based on mm -hmm. the trial availability and attorney availability. You could wind up having four or five trials, if you will. They weren't going to win the sever because... Each of these defendants on the RICO, they've all been charged with very different crimes and very different um, um, uh, act, bad acts under, uh, based on this conspiracy theory. And so they don't have adverse interests, at least not at this point, Juan. And there's no real threat of confusing the jury or misapplying the law in, in connection to different defendants, at least not at this point. So I would expect more motions. But you could see three, four, five different trials going on with different groups of these defendants as we move forward. Rebecca, the thing that I think is also great here, the judge made clear this is going to be televised. And so unlike federal court where they're not televised, people are going to be able to watch the proceedings of these trials. You know, Roland, I think this indeed will be the 21st century's version of the trial of the century. I think it's very important that the American um, public, including and not just the American um, public, but um, the world, to actually see what happens during this trial so we can hear firsthand the things that Donald Trump and his co-conspirators did in attempts to subvert uh, the legitimacy and to undo uh, the 2020 um, election. Um, the other thing, like, Roland, I think we're going to have to set up a whiteboard in the studio just to be able to diagram everything that we're going to see over the next um, upcoming months and pro potentially years. Um, Robert, um, uh, again, th this is going to be, obviously, it's complex. Look, he's been indicted in four, in four different places, uh, and it seems that uh, every month there's a new indictment with, this, with the thug-in-chief. Uh, and so, uh, but what you have here, uh, you also have uh, a very aggressive district attorney. Uh, you've got attorneys uh, for these various folks who have tried to, in essence, squeeze her and do you think they've been shocked with the response from her team by saying, oh, you want a speedy trial? Let's go. You know, this is one of those issues I always try to tell people that don't bring your out-of-town lawyer to the local court. 
for a very specific reason, that do you have local relationships, do you have understanding with judges? You know, I've tried cases against Fonnie Will uh, Willis before, I've tried cases against all these uh, DAs before, won cases against them. Uh, and I think that's important for people to understand that the Fulton County Court works differently than any other court in the state of Georgia, just simply because of the size of Fulton County and the number of uh, crimes that are being committed uh, and the high-profile nature. You know, we, uh, we have the YSL trial, we have the uh, Atlanta teachers' uh, RICO case from a few years ago, we had the Ray Lewis prosecution in the same courthouse. You know, big cases happen here. And so this uh, DA's office is used to handling these big, high-profile cases. And part of the strategy in, of these RICO cases, because the Georgia RICO st uh, statute is one of the broadest in the country, it acts like a funnel. You know, what your goal is to get the person at the top of the criminal organization. So you start with your Coffee County campaign worker, your bailiffs bondsman, your uh, publicist for Kanye, your black Trump, Trump person, and you get those people, you group them into the, uh, into a first trial batch, and you try to get them either as cooperating witnesses or, or uh, convictions in order to convince the next tranche of people, uh, you know, the lower-level attorneys, the people who were uh, just kind of lower-level people in the conspiracy, to get them to understand that you're serious about that, and then they start cooperating. Operating, with the goal being to get to that top line of people, to the uh, Trump, the Mark Meadows, the Giuliani, um, the Eastman of the situation, I think that's what we're seeing happening. I think Cheeseboro and Powell are very quickly going to understand uh, before they get to trial in October. I, I'm I will put money on them taking a plea deal prior to going to trial in October, given the current trial date, and simply because the the defenses they've presented thus far are very procedural, and uh, and once you start uh, getting people who are you know, up there in age and who are used to a certain lifestyle, and once it kind of starts to set in that you might be looking at five years in prison if you lose this, uh, versus being able to take a probated sentence for uh, be, being a cooperating witness, you're going to start seeing the tone of these things change. Even even in August, October seems a long way away. Take that calendar over to September. Now October seems a whole lot closer. I think you're going to see a lot more rational conversations coming out of the defense team for these clients. Scott? Well, you know, the, the ones that go first have the most risk. And the other co-defendants and defense counsel will be watching how those cases play out and whether you get convicted or they, or they don't get convictions. Watch what happens after that first trial. Two things happen. The government gets better at presenting this case, one, because they presented it once against a handful of defendants, and the defenses get better and stronger. But what wins cases for prosecutors or the defense are the facts of the case and how well you present them. Lawyers don't win cases. Facts win cases. And there are a lot of facts to digest. The other thing about RICO cases you have to remember is these are very difficult to prove. I don't like RICO cases. I've prosecuted them and I've defended them, and I don't like them because it's hard to get the jury focused and to sift through those facts. They're not simple facts. The government has to do a great job at that. The defense counsel has to do a great job at attacking them, right? But getting a, a verdict of guilty or not guilty is very difficult for both sides. So the more trials, the more trials you do and the more times you try the cases under that indictment, the better both sides get. Um, it is going to be um, trials of a great interest, uh, Rebecca. And here's the deal. Um, this is going on while you have an election going on. Uh, you've got Republicans who are saying, oh, this is election interference. It clearly uh, has uh, tightened Donald Trump's grip uh, on the uh, Republican Party. But it also, frankly, aids uh, President Joe Biden because if this thing goes forward, and let's say he's convicted, you have a president who gets to say, you want to re-elect a convicted felon? So here's the other thing. Um, the American people also lose out because we deserve that robust policy discussions all through 2024 to really understand what each party is bringing to the table in terms of policy with how they plan to govern um, this country um, through the executive over the next four years. We're going to miss out on that because this is going to be clearly a circus next year. And just like you mentioned, starting in January, there will be Americans going to the polls 
um, to uh, participate in the presidential primaries. And once that clock starts ticking, then it's almost going to be, I can imagine, a Super Tuesday side by side with updates with what's happening at the trial. So it's going to be a major um, distraction for the Republican Party, but it's also going to be a major distraction on, on, on the Democratic side as well, because we're going to miss out on having those deep discussions and real robust discussions and what's good for this country, what's good for black people, what's good for black communities in this country. So unfortunately, I think we're going to lose out because of this circus and the sideshow that's about to happen. Um, however, at the same time, I want your viewers also to pay attention when we start to see um, campaign filings, uh, specifically when we see how much money is being raised. I'm really curious if Republican donors and the very big mega donors will continue to um, donate to Donald Trump or if his coffers are going to dry up. Because we know right now, essentially, um, his campaign um, funds are really going to cover um, court costs and attorney's fees. So it's going to be really interesting watching what's happening, especially on the Republican side, to see who the number two and the number three um, likely contenders will be. And I think we're going to start to see shifts in early January, um, especially with seeing what Republican donors are going to do and which candidate they're going to back. Folks, hold tight one uh, second. H hold on, Robert. We're going, to, we're going to go to a quick break. We're going to pick up on this. We come back also uh, in the classified documents case. One of those witnesses, one of the people, one of the witnesses, oh, has cut a deal with prosecutors. That's never a good thing when they start cutting deals. We'll tell you next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Black women are starving businesses at the fastest rate than any other segment. However, finding the funding to build them is challenging. On our next Get Wealthy, we're going to talk with author Katherine Finney, who wrote the book, Build the Damn Thing. And she's going to be sharing exactly what we need to do to achieve success in spite of the odds. As an entrepreneur of color, it's first, you know, building your personal advisory board. I think that's one of the things that's helped me the most. The personal advisory board of the people who are in the business of you you personally and want to see you succeed. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Up next on The Frequency with me, D Barnes, we're going to talk to Leslie Seagar, a.k.a. Big Les, and talk about her incredible career as a dancer, choreographer, and VJ of Rap City. Magic Johnson was there, so half the NBA was there. Iman the supermodel, so all the supermodels were there every day. After right. the, like, it was a who's who of who's who. Right here on The Frequency in the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Marissa Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hello, I'm Jamia Pugh. I Hi, I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. I don't say, I don't play Sammy, but I could. Or I don't play Obama, but I could. I don't do Stallone, but I could do all that. And I am here with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. All right, um, in that classified documents case, guess what? One of those witnesses has cut a deal with prosecutors. Come on, Pat. Uh, of course, um, you know, in this case, this is the Yahoo story here, uh, and it lays out uh, exactly uh, what's going on here. Uh, go right back to it. Keep witness in the case. Uh, of course, after he dropped Trump's attorneys, uh, Walt Nada, uh, one of the two Trump employees, is going to be providing testimony. Uh, Scott, if you are a defendant, the last thing you want is, first of all, when Trump was paying for that dude's attorneys and he dropped Trump's attorneys, got his own attorney, then he's like, I need a deal. I keep yeah. telling him, to to, these other people are not trying to go to prison for that fool. 
you're going to see more of these cooperations, the lower level people who are important factual witnesses for the prosecution. And you'll see that when they give up Donald Trump's lawyer and get their own independent counsel, their defense changes because they don't want to go to jail. They don't want to continue to defend Donald Trump or be connected to him in exchange for their liberty. It's just natural. And so uh, what's important about this cooperator in the documents case is the government now has a witness that can, can testify. They've got to cooperate in exchange for a deal, and they certainly don't want to be uh, tried and convicted. They have one person that can say, I had a conversation with Walt Nada, and Walt Nada told me to try to get rid of this these tapes, and it was coming from the boss. And it took place at Westminster or wherever his golf uh, country club was. And so it puts Donald Trump there, puts Walt Nada there, and it has a direct conversation with the IT person. This is really bad for Donald Trump. Now, having said that, the defense will cross-examine uh, the IT individual, Tavares, I think. They'll cross-examine him and say, you cut a deal with the government in exchange to save your hide and to not go to jail. That's your greatest motivator for lying. Maybe, maybe not, but at least, but this is the dirty business of criminal prosecution. Sometimes you got to get witnesses that even lied in the grand jury. The government's going to have to rehabilitate him and make him make sense and make the government, or rather make the jury, believe that he's not credible. It'll be a toss-up, and it'll be depending on what the jury believes and doesn't believe. But this is a good witness for the government. They've got to clean him up, though, because he lied before in the grand jury. Uh, again, uh, listen, I just think that um, what you're about to find out, uh, Rebecca, that that protective wall around the orange one is going to crumble. And you're already seeing, uh, you know, what's going on. And I think politically as well, yes, his base is hardening, but the bottom line is you're going to have more and more people saying, okay, I know Biden is old, but do we actually want this crook back in the Oval Office? You know, I'm hoping that's the calculus that many Americans will have in the back of their mind as they're going into um, the voting booth um, next fall. But you know what? I, I still think that Trump could still win um, his primary. And also, you know, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Let's be real clear. Let's be real clear. He is likely going to win the primary. I'm talking about the general election. I'm, I'm simply making the assumption he's going to win the primary. He is going to be the Republican nominee. Right, and that's yeah, a that's good assumption. And that's a, that's a very safe bet. <laughs> What's also concerning, and just for your viewers to understand, there is nothing within our Constitution that could stop him from getting reelected if he has the majority of votes next fall. Like, full stop. Him being convicted doesn't stop him. There's of nothing course, in the Constitution course. that says that. Um, he, us knowing that he is a criminal, he interfered actively with elections, he did treasonous um, type activities and behavior, there still isn't a fail safe within our system right now um, to be able to stop him. So I'm hoping there are enough Americans, and I'm hoping there's enough people who normally don't show up to vote who decide that next election is actually important enough um, when we're thinking about what, how do we move forward with our country? Because if he goes back into the Oval and we know that he is a clear and present danger, we know he is actively engaged in criminal activity. Everything that he did um, in his first administration will appear to be child's play. Like, I think we're going to see outright, outfront corruption in ways that we haven't seen before. I mean, it, it's going to be like, you, you know, I, I'm... I, I, I think in 50 years, when we start to see even like some of the money transfers that some people have claimed that have happened with him enriching himself, his businesses um, and his kids' businesses and his um, cronies' businesses as well, that's nothing compared to what he would do in the second administration. Here's, here's the thing, Robert. I, I think that, again, having a corrupt, four times indicted opponent aids a President Biden. Do you agree? No. No, I don't. I, I think that we are living in a society that has had the last 30 years being pumped full of house of cards, being pumped full of scandal, uh, being pumped full of all these uh, political corruption shows, and we live in a celebrity culture right now. And the, the truth is that President, uh, the former President Trump is being aided by all of these things. Ever since he started getting indicted, his numbers have shot up in the Republican primary polls to the point that he's all but clinched the nomination. We've also, however, seen that now he is 
pulled into a tie with President Biden in national polling and, and even is ahead of President Biden in some of these polls. And what I also think people can't discount is President Trump still has such control over his party that he can simply say if he's convicted, uh, he can make a backroom deal with Ronald McDowell, uh, McDonald or whoever the hell the uh, RNC chairperson is and say, well, look, Don Jr. is going to be running for me since these people are persecuting me. The Trump base rallies behind him. He runs on a platform of I'm here to avenge my father. He gets elected. He immediately pardons Trump and all the January 6th protesters. Uh, you know, that, that we live in a world where that's no longer a crazy conversation. If, it, if you had asked any of us five years ago what crazy redneck stormed the Capitol and smear feces on the wall, we would say, no, that's crazy. That's not something that's going to happen. We're past the point of crazy in this country. So this is why it's so important that the criminal justice system actually exert all of its power, particularly on these state-level prosecutions. And what I was going to say before the break, if you are in Atlanta, Georgia, or anywhere in the state of Georgia, you need to be registered to vote. Why? Because the only way you can serve on a jury, be part of that jury selection pool, is if you are a registered voter. And part of the process, once we get to trial, is going to be the process of voir dire, or we call in Georgia voir dire, uh, where we're going to be picking juries. And the Trump uh, the Trump lawyers and all the co-defendant lawyers are going to be trying to find one little old MAGA lady from Sandy Springs or Johns Creek or Milton to sit on that jury. And it only takes one, regardless of what the facts are, regardless of what the evidence is produced. If you can get one diehard MAGA loyalist on that jury, all these people could skate. They could all walk off completely. So that's why it's important we get involved in the jury pool, but also instead, the only way to beat the dragon is to beat the dragon. It's not enough to hope that Donald Trump defeats himself and loses by default. They're going to have to get out their campaign. They're going to have to make the promises. They're going to have to put in the legislation. They're going to have to register the voters to actually win this once and for all. That's the only way to bring this chapter of American history to an end. Here's the deal, Scott. I mean, look, look first of all, I, I, I get um, where we are, but the reality is our, our politics is split. And I think, first of all, when you look at some of these polls, let's, let's understand several different things. First of all, the poll that came out this weekend from the Wall Street Journal, that was with uh, a Republican pollster who did business with Paul Manafort. So that poll is irrelevant to me, okay? It's, a, it's an absolute bullshit poll. But, he, but, he, but here's the thing. If you look at any poll, one, many of the polls are also uh, uh, where they read it because a significant number of Democrats poll think Biden is too old. The point is this here. By, barring anything health-wise, Biden is going to be the nominee. And I make any poll today means nothing to me. It means absolutely nothing. What I'm looking at the fact is that when he steps out there, you're going to see, I think, in many ways what you saw four years ago, where Biden is saying, this person, and that this person cannot and will not and should not be back in the Oval Office. And he's done so many things since that you have independent voters, you've got other voters uh, who are not going to be voting for Republican. I just simply think, absolutely, the best chance for a Biden re-election is to face Donald Trump. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. In a set another way, you don't have a... Where does he get his votes from? The Democrats aren't going to vote for him, even if they think Biden is... Right. Fact that he has a ceiling. Old. Trump has a ceiling. Biden has a floor. That's a different deal. Exactly. Because those same Democratic voters that will say, he's too old to run, I want somebody else to run, I want somebody else to run against him, the bottom line is if Biden's on the ballot, Democrats are voting for Biden. It's a very different question. Then you look at the independents. Anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of independents aren't going to vote for aren't going to vote for Donald Trump facing these 91 criminal felony charges, right? So who are they going to vote for? In the end, whether they like it or not, they're going to vote for Biden and maybe someone else. There are not enough votes for Trump in order to be, win this general election. you got to believe that. And the trials are starting in March of 2024. So where is he going to get his votes? Are the MAGA supporters and those disenfranchised, poor white uh, Southern and, and, and uh, rural voters, are they going to do who have never voted before? It costs time, money, and resources to cultivate them and to have them come out in the masses. And it's just not going to happen. Why? Because he spent $40 million on legal fees. He's going to spend 40, 80, maybe even $100 million on legal fees. That gets old. Those are monies that can be spent on finding new voters, and it's being spent on lawyers. So he's got, listen, he'd have to run the table 
and beat all 91 of these felony criminal state and federal charges in order to be free to enter the White House. It's never been done in the history of this country. And I got to tell you, you may not want to vote or rather bet against Donald Trump, but I'm betting against him that he can't beat all 91 of these charges. And here's the thing that jumps out. Here's the thing that jumps out here, Rebecca, that I think is critically important. You still have to look at elections as, frankly, statewide elections. The reality is, we saw that Supreme Court race in Wisconsin, where uh, that that, uh, that 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 female jurist she beat the Republican by 11 points. Over the next year, you may very well have the Wisconsin Supreme Court rule against political gerrymandering, rule for. Uh, abortion rights uh, and, and restore a lot of those powers uh, to Tony Evers, who is the Democratic governor. Okay, so the, so that so you look at Wisconsin, you look at Pennsylvania, which Biden won by a hundred hundred ten thousand dollars. You saw Fetterman beat back Dr. Oz there as well. Now you look at you look at Georgia, still uh, extremely competitive. I think I, it's not going to be it's going to be a tough uh, state to win again, but they can. Then you look at Arizona as well. So the pathway, again, to winning the presidency, he has to win. He has to win. Remember, he only won by seventy-seven thousand votes against Hillary Clinton uh, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, and in Wisconsin. And so, if you're the Biden campaign, you're focusing on that. Uh, I'm not. I keep telling people these 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 nationwide polls. They mean nothing. A presidential election is based upon a series of state polls, not national polls. Because we already saw what happened. You can win the most national votes and not win the election, Hillary Clinton. That's right. So look, you're right about some things, but I also strongly disagree with you about other things. Such as you're right. It's too early to look. So it's too early to start looking at polls. Like full stop. No, really it's too it's know. too early to look at national polls because presidential elections they are they are a combination of state results. That's what I'm saying. Who gives a shit if Biden wins, beats Trump by three million votes in California? It doesn't matter. There are other states that he has to win. He's going to win California. So I don't care about California in the national poll. I'm looking at how is he running in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, Arizona, Michigan, Ohio. How is he running in Florida? That's what I'm looking at. And also, what are these crazies in New Hampshire going to do who are now pissed off because the Democrats chose to go with South Carolina first and not New Hampshire and Iowa? That's what I'm looking at. So, yes, I understand what I, I understand your framework, but this is something that I think we need to step back. We're in a completely different world, and um, Robert's right on this issue. Like, those old rules are out the window. Um, and, and to answer you and Scott's question of where is Trump going to find these people, the same place he found them in 2016. He found people who have been off of the voting rolls since the 80s. And so when I tell you, like, all my years of doing campaigns where you're looking at voters who are um, high propensity voters or voters who are low propensity, and for your viewers, what that means is they're likely to turn out and vote. So he literally found people who haven't voted in such a long time, they were no longer on the voting rolls, and he was able to get them out. The second thing is, Trump is not the same type of candidate as, like, a Mitt Romney. He's not the same type of candidate as a Nikki Haley, where he's going to need a billion dollars behind him in order for him to... Um, generate enough uh, interest and to get enough airtime for people to be aware that he's on the ballot. He is such an incendiary character in American politics. He literally doesn't have to spend one dollar in advertising in order to still dominate the airwaves. We've seen that happen. In fact, I will blame some of the mainstream media for him, his um, candidacy actually becoming legitimate um, during um, fall 2015. Because I remember the summer of 2015 when he was talking about running, he was getting into the race as we went into the August, um, the two-night special. Oh, I mean, um, I, 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 I totally understand in terms of him generating attention. That, that's, that's not my issue. What I'm saying is the biggest mistake that I see right now is having conversations on this poll says this, this poll says that. I think right now, again, I'm looking at states. I'm looking at how does a person perform in the states. But the other thing is, how do you shore up weaknesses? When Scott says 
It was Scott says, where's he going to get the votes from? This is what Trump needs, which is actually how he won in 16. It wasn't just he pulled out people who had not voted. You also had, on the Democratic side, depressed turnout. There were people yeah. who were like, I just can't vote for Hillary Clinton. So what you're facing with is, the question is, are you going to see increasing turnout? Republicans are scared to death right now. Why? Because of abortion. They saw how crucial that was in 2022. It's going to be on the ballot in 2024. What I'm just simply saying is, for, for a lot of people, pump your brakes, calm the hell down, ignore all of these national polls, and the focus needs to be on voter education, teaching people about exactly what's happening. Because when you see polls that show 60 and 70 and 80 percent of people agreeing with policies uh, that Biden has done, but then you see the same poll going, oh, people say the economy is going so bad, you're like, what the hell are you talking about? And so they have to deal with that. I'm just saying for a lot of folks who are fretting, this is going to be a Biden-Trump matchup. Unless something crazy happens on the GOP side, unless something happens with his health, that's who this is going to be. We better be, simply be, be prepared for that to be the matchup. But crazy is happening right now. Like, here's some breaking news out of Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, they're trying to figure out how to pull that female jurist that just won in the spring. They're trying to pull yeah, her no. off the bench. Yeah, no, no. We're, 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 no. Teaching, and that is the test case that they're going to roll out in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. It's the test case that they're going to run off, uh, run through um, with several of the southern states as well. So what we're seeing on the Republican side right now is they're literally manipulating the rules. Of course. In Georgia, they're actively throwing people off of the poll, uh, off of the yes. roles. So Republicans right now, so, so their strategy isn't the typical uh, fair gentleman strategy. No, no, no. Their strategy is what they've done. The, but their strategy is what, but their strategy is what they've done the last four elections. They want to, they want to decrease the size of the electorate. They want to ban ballot drop boxes. They want to have voter ID. We already know what they're going to do. I'm simply... But the Democrats don't have an answer for it right now. That's and not that's true. That, no, that's... Concerned. Actually, Rebecca, that simply is not true. The Mark Elias, the LDF, Laws Committee, they have been winning in the courts. They literally have been beating them on many of these voter restrictions. That's simply not true. Now, what you talk about in Wisconsin, yeah, Republicans are floating that, but here's the deal in Wisconsin, all right? We talked about this on yesterday. You have a woman who beats Republican by 11 points. It was a statewide race. Republicans make that move, then she's then all of a sudden this race is on the ballot next year. You now could drive serious turnout next year as well. So we we already know they're going to cheat to win. We know this. So what I'm the saying, the White House hasn't listed out an answer yet. So when I talk about the Democratic Party, I'm, I'm, I'm not what even I'm really saying is we need to see what is the White House's strategy for actually um, beating back on. No, no, we don't. We need to. No, we don't. But the, no, but Rebecca, I'm we can't wait on the them. White House has an answer for it right now. But here's Rebecca. Here's my whole point. We don't need to wait on the White House to give an answer. We already know what our answer is, and this is what I've been saying. To all our people, do not give money to political campaigns. Don't send money to the DNC. Send that money to third-party groups who are going to be on the ground. I'm not, I'm not waiting on Biden-Harris campaign to say, hey, here's our plan. The lawyers, the lawyers, they're like, hey, look, they've already, uh, the DNC cut with Mark Elias and his group. They're still suing. So they're doing their part. What I'm saying is we cannot wait for somebody else to come up with a strategy. I'm saying to our audience, it's going to be Biden versus Trump. We already know that what that thug is going to do. For black people, our job is to drive our numbers. But we cannot, I'm not waiting on anybody who's two blocks from here to come up with their strategy. I'm saying black people, we have our own strategy, and that's our own survival. And that's how we got to be focused. So if we're going to save the day, what do we get out of it? What is the deal that mm -hmm. we cut with the White House if indeed we are the we are the cavalry that's going to save this White House? First of all, we know uh, black folks are going to be the tipping point. They're going to decide who wins the White House. Well, no, no, no. I, hold up, hold up. Depend upon the state. We know black. Depend upon the state. I, I we're, 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 we're not going to be the tipping. We go state by, but if we go state by state, if we go through um, the states, that's going to tip the election. It's still going to be the black vote that's ultimately going to serve as a tipping point. No, it's not. To determine who wins. Not the in Arizona. Not in Arizona. 
Not in we Arizona. Well, we get Virginia, we get Pennsylvania, we don't need Arizona. No, 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 actually, but here's the deal, though. No, no, you still need Arizona, and that's part of the deal. What Democrats cannot do is do what Hillary did by saying, hey, let's lock down uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, hey, we're good. No, 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 no. My deal is, I'm assuming Republicans are going to win Georgia this time. You do need Arizona. Robert, go. Well, look, Roland, just to that point, remember that Donald Trump received $3.5 billion in free media in 2015 to win the 2016 election. So this the money in politics thing is now a thing of the past. Donald Trump generates free media. We spent the first 30, 40 minutes of the show giving Donald Trump free media because the Biden campaign has been completely inept when it comes to messaging and when it comes to a press strategy. We, we are, you're across the damn street from the White House. They have somebody from the White House on this show three nights a week, but they're not going to do it. Talk to black ra talk radio show hosts across the country, including my show and including every show on my network. Try to get a Biden official on your damn show. They don't exist. They won't come and talk about the policies. Try to get them to be on a blog or be on a podcast or to talk to people. They won't do it. They are writing the recipe for them to lose this. No, election. I want to... Well, first of all, for, 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 hold on, no, hold on, hold on. No, I mean, no, 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 hold on. no, I got to correct you. No, no, I got to correct you. First of all, we ain't got a problem having them on. It's I'm deciding who I want to have on. I'm not accepting just anybody. So that's first. That's first and foremost. Because also, I get the emails all the time, them offering up folks, so I'm not always saying yes to somebody. That's one. But this is what I'm also saying. I'm saying I'm not interested in waiting on them. What I am saying to black people, we can create our own mechanism. And what I am saying is, I had a conversation with Latasha Brown last night with Black Voters Matter, with Tamika Mallory, Until Freedom. Tamika Mallory, Until Freedom, they are opening their own office next week in Kentucky to take down Daniel Cameron. They're not waiting on anybody else. So what I am saying to our people, damn what Biden and Harris and who they're offering up, we can have our own surrogates, our own messaging, speaking to our own issues. Hear what, here's what we know as a fact. What the Republicans are planning to do if they win the White House is going to have severe and dire consequences for black people. They literally, right now, are meeting and crafting a plan of action to fire thousands of federal workers. Who over-indexes the federal government? Black people. They want to have loyalty tests. Who is that going to hurt? Black people. And so what I'm saying is, damn waiting on them to come up with a battle plan. There's a black battle plan that we should be devising as we speak that speaks to our interests. And when I say our interests, we can sit here and negotiate and make demands of the White House as very well that we should. But I can tell you this, I know what I want to see again if a Biden-Harris is reelected, another 200 federal judges, which then impacts when we sue in the, uh, in, in the federal system. What I want to see if there's a Biden-Harris reelection is what you've seen with the Department of Justice, where they've been going after prison wardens and jailers. And they right now, there are nine patterns and practices investigations in the DOJ in the last three years. It was one under Donald Trump. So I know what I am asking for. What I'm saying is create our black plan. Damn waiting on them. Well, look, Roland, I think black folks are tired of being political sharecroppers for these people. You can pass a $4, a $4 trillion uh, uh, debt reduction plan, a $3.5 trillion if our, uh, omnibus spending bill, $1.7 trillion uh, uh, infrastructure bill. You got a $1.5 trillion Build Back Better bill. You have a Stop Asian Hate Crime bill. You got a, a Respect for Marriage. You got all this huge legislative agenda, but then when it gets down to, hey, can you stop police from beating the hell out of black people and pass some legislation, they get real quiet. No, 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 Robert, about, Robert, that's a lie. Robert, that's a damn lie. Robert, the George Roy, that Robert, that Robert, that is a lie. Robert, that is a lie. No, Robert, that is a lie. Robert, the George Floyd Justice Act was passed by the House. By the House. It gets to the Senate. It was stopped by two people, Tim Scott and Lindsey Graham. 
stupid. But Roland, Roland, that's the point that I'm trying to make. How the hell do you pass through a $3.5 trillion uh, uh, omnibus spending bill, but you can't get past two people? Easy, easy, Robert, issue. because Republicans like, because Republicans want money, you, too. You, you can blame the Republicans on everything. Robert, no, 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 Rob, 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 Robert, let's be real clear. Hold on, hold on, Robert, Robert. Rob, no, 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 Robert, Robert. That's bullshit. Robert, that's bullshit. No, Robert, Robert, what was the vote total for the omnibus spending bill? Enough to pass. No, no, no. What was the vote total? Enough to pass. It passed. How, so, it so it's, how many items? How many items in the omnibus spending bill the Republicans also want? They, they were able to negotiate something where they got it done. The same thing with the debt ceiling reduction act. The same thing with the. Uh, I'm asking. No, no. I'm asking again. I'm asking again. I'm asking again. What was what was the vote total? The vote total was enough to pass the bill into law. And what I'm saying with the omnibus spending bill, what you have is Republicans wanted a whole bunch of that money as well. We So to say, well, they got enough votes over here because Republicans voted. There wasn't a single Republican, not one, that stepped up and said they would support the George Ford Justice Act. Not one. Now, how can you get that passed with only 49 or 50 Democrats? The way you get it passed is you negotiate the same way they did with all the legislation they got passed. You could negotiate. You could not negotiate. What are you talking about? Robert, where the fuck were you? Robert, no, Robert. Robert, Robert, two people, two people were, Republic, were, were negotiating for the Republicans. Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott, two people. We have it on record where two of the police unions said the, the Fraternal Order of Police was one of them. They said, they contradicted Tim Scott. And they said, not one time did we see Democrats want to defund the police. Tim Scott says, well, the sheriff in my state said, I disagree with this. That's how it got killed. Tim Scott and Lindsey Graham promised the families, I talked to them outside of this building on the anniversary of George Floyd's death. He promised them, we are going to get the Republican votes. They never did. So, you can't pass a bill where you need 60 votes if you can't even get one Republican. They negotiated for months. Those two could not get any other Republicans, and they kill the bill. So let's stop acting like Biden Harris couldn't do anything and get it passed when Tim Scott, Tim Scott is the reason why there is no George Floyd Justice Act. We got to be willing to say it and not run from it. Look, Roland, the point that I'm trying to make is... No, 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 no. You said they couldn't get it done, but you got to explain to black people why it didn't get done. Let me explain why they didn't get it done. Look, Roland, Roland. Look, Roland, just on this point. Scott, hold on. Okay, Rob, make your point. I'm going to Scott. Go. Here's the point I'm trying to make when, I'm talk, when we're talking about uh, negotiating things and giving and taking. Let's take the um, the, the debt ceiling. No, 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 no. Stay, no, no, Robert. Stay on the George Floyd Justice Act. Let me give you the example that I'm trying to give you. They, tr they, were, they were on the debt ceiling deal. They were able to get people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Kevin McCarthy to vote for something that was against their entire caucus. Take that uh, for a point. We've heard Republicans talking about reforming the Department of Justice to uh, reform, uh, reform the FBI. Roll that into an omnibus criminal justice reform bill where you say we'll reform the DOJ and the FBI if you incorporate that into the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill and also the Tyree Nichols Duty and inter Intervene Bill. And that's how you get the votes that you need to have a compromised bill. Robert, so, Robert, you're Robert, Robert, you're talking, Robert, you're talking, Robert, 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 you're talking about the House. It passed the House. The House ain't the problem, Robert. It was the Senate. Bro, the House is the problem now because you have a Republican majority in the House. Robert, so the listen to me, Robert. Robert, listen to me. All they needed, Robert, in the House was a one-vote majority, 218. Mm -hmm. That's all they needed. In the Senate, they needed 60. Let me say it again. In the House, all they needed was 218. 
217 could be against, it passes. That's 435. In the Senate, they couldn't do 50-50, and Kamala Harris breaks the tie. They couldn't do 51-49. They had to get to the 60-vote threshold. The negotiation that you're talking about, you say they should have done, they did that. We had Congresswoman Karen Bass on this show. We had Senator Cory Booker on this show. They were the lead negotiators. Everything they put on the table, they could not do it. It was Senator Tim Scott who came in and said, oh, y'all want to defund the police? That's a bridge too far. And he killed it. He didn't even call the family members to tell them if they were stopping negotiations on the deal. That's what the hell happened. So I'm trying to figure out what in the hell are you talking about that you could have somehow got it through the Senate when they clearly did not want the bill at all? Because they got everything else they want to do through. You can't tell me you got everything else on your agenda done, but then when you get the black folks... You didn't get everything on your agenda. I ran out of steam. You didn't get everything on your agenda. I got infrastructure done. I got the debt ceiling done. But black folks, wait, just vote for me one more time and I'll get to you next time. No, no, that's not what it is. What it is is, what it is is, is understanding the very people who are against you and when, and when, when a Senator Tim Scott sits there and, sit, and, and straight up, and straight up lies on Face the Nation. And then when I text him, he couldn't answer when I said, wait a minute, their proposal was the same one you proposed last year. He stopped answering. His staff stopped answering. They were full of shit from the beginning. They, and then Senator Tim Scott then spoke against the crap that was in the, in the executive order that Trump signed. I said, well, wait a minute, hold up. You stood there and supported that. Here was the real deal. He was supposedly for... P police reform, when Trump was there, he was, he was not going to give Biden that victory. You know why? Because Scott was running for president all along. That was the real deal, Scott. So we got screwed. We, so we got screwed because Senator Tim Scott was running for president and he needed that sheriff in South Carolina supporting him. That's the fact. Tim Scott, make your point. Scott, Tim Scott's at 3%. How could that be your strategy? The problem that Robert Petillo is having with you and your analysis is because you sound like an apologist for the Biden uh, Harris. No, I sound like a fat giver. Blame Tim Scott. I'm telling you what you sound like, right? No, no, I'm, well, hold on, but I'm telling you what happened. Okay, you tell me what happened then. Tell me what happened. The Harris team didn't get it done, and you don't want to point fingers at them. No, 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 you're wrong. Tell me what happened. Point fingers at both of them. No, right? tell me. No, no, Scott. Because what happened? People ain't voting for Republicans. What happened? They voted for Democrats, and that White House didn't get it done. Let me say it again. So I'm gonna, hold on, Scott. I'm going to ask you again. No, 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 Scott. I'm going to ask you to answer this. No, 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 Scott. No, 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 Scott. No, no, no. no Scott. It passed the House. Scott, it passed the House. You tell me. How... No, hold on, Scott. Hold on, Scott. No, 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 Scott. Scott. Hold on, Scott. No, Scott. Answer the question. Scott, answer the question. It passed the House. You tell me how they could have gone through the Senate. Uh, I got a point I mean, the rule that, fact that says I'm the president of the United States, and if I do everything humanly possible to get those votes in the Senate, to convince those two Republicans... No! This Scott, you needed 10 if Republicans! Says that, fine, Scott, you needed 10 Republicans! He just gave up. Scott, he said, you needed 10 Republicans. Scott, let me ask you Let me ask you again, Scott. Scott, I'm gonna ask you again, Scott. How do you get 10 Republicans when you can't get two? I'll wait. Then don't promise it then. Then don't promise it if you can't get it. No, let me ask you a question. Man, 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 you can't even manage the man. It's pathetic. I, I wanna know again. Scott, answer the question. How can you get 10 if you can't get two? I said my piece on this. No, 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 Scott, you're not even answering. You can't even answer the question. You can't even answer it. You can't even answer it. You sound like an apologist for Biden here. No, no, what I sound, no, no, what I sound like, no, no, what I sound like is somebody who actually paid attention, who talked to the principals, who, no, 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 hold up, oh, excuse me, let me say it again. You be right about everything. Hold up, oh, but Scott, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, Scott. Did you have any conversations with the Democrat negotiators? Any? Sure, I did. No, 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 Scott, 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 no, no, Scott, 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 hold on, Scott, on this bill, did you have any conversations with Congressman Karen Bass and Senator Cory Booker about these negotiations? 
Did you? Yes. Did you? I am not done. Hold up, so Scott. You, Hold up, Scott. Scott, I'm not done. Hold up, Scott. Done. Scott, wait a minute. Scott, did you have any conversations with Tim, Tim Scott about these negotiations? No. Not Scott, not. hold up. Did you have any conversations with the families of the people who were victims of police violence who were part of the negotiations? Yeah, on your show. Okay, your so, show. so so help me out. So, so let me be clear. Let me be clear. You didn't talk to none of the Democrats negotiating, none of the Republicans, and only on the show talk to the families. I talked to all three, so why in the hell Don't should we listen to you? Get it done. I'm resource-driven. I no, no, no. Driven leadership. Well, what I do, what I, what I do is, I don't just talk. With, but here's what I do, Scott. What, here's what I do, Scott. I don't just talk on a show. I talk to the principals, and that's the difference between being informed and uninformed. Uh, Scott, Scott, you're uninformed. You're uninformed. Scott, the only way you know about the negotiations, because hell, I'm the one who told you. Rebecca, make your point. Rebecca, make your point, Rebecca. So, I mean, there's different tools that we've seen that happen in the past, especially uh, 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 Mitch. Something that we've seen that the Republicans do really well in the Senate is they either suspend the rules or they amend the rules package. And for your viewers to understand that, it's the rules of how the Senate works with what is passage, like whether you need 50 plus one or whether or not you need 60 in order for something to advance out of the Senate. And so one thing that I will say the, the Democrats could you, could experiment and figure out, all right, are we going to suspend the rules or are we going to amend the rules package and change what that threshold? Because there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to have 60 votes in order for something to pass the Senate. What happens at the begin, beginning of each Congress is on the House side and the Senate side, um, both leaderships determine what are the rules for something to determine um, passage. So in the Senate... One of the tools that the senators can do, one of the things that um, Schumer could have done was either suspend the rules, change the rules package, or figure out, okay, we know if this is um, if this is a particular legislative package that deals with money, um, then then you could also do different maneuverings. In order but to but, get this, but this but this one but this one but the, the George Floyd just is that was to deal with money. But, but so rolling, one rolling. thing that so for my so I worked on the Hill on the Affordable Care Act. And one of the different things that we floated around, I worked for Congressman Dingo, is figure out, okay, if we actually have to fight on the Senate side in order to get uh, to get that passed, because remember a couple people, um, there was the open seat in... Um, yeah, it was in Massachusetts, in, uh, Scott Brown. Massachusetts, yeah, Scott Brown. So it was sitting down with um, parliamentarians on the Senate side to figure out, okay, so what do we do in order to get this thing passed? What are our different avenues? So that happens on each major yeah. piece of legislation. And that was, While it, I hear you on the technical aspects, you are right, Roland, that it was hard for um, the Democrats to pass it. I don't think it was impossible if they had enough will if they wanted to expand political capital. Again, and, 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 and hold up, and one second, one second, and one second, one second, excuse me. Excuse me, and you said in order to do that, then that meant Senator Chuck Schumer then would have to lead his Democratic caucus to change the rules. And to do that, how many votes would he have needed to change those rules? He would have needed 60 to change the rules. Stop. Hold on one second. One second. To... One second. You said he would need a 60. How many Democratic votes did he have? He had 50. And really, he had 48 because Cinema and Mansion would not have gone with it, correct? Right. But I've seen Mitch. No, 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 no I'm just no, 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 I'm stating. But you should say it in order to change. Let me for everybody who's watching. You said in, in order, order to change the rules, it, you would need. To, I believe is 60 that you so, would so, need to so, adopt the rules. So in order Actually, to change. Wait a minute. If we go back to the beginning. Hold on one second. I don't think we need it 60. Hold on. You said in order to change the rules, you wouldn't need 60. And, and you needed 60 for the George Floyd Justice Act. You couldn't get to 60. Because in order to change it, you would need to convince 10 Republicans to do it. Do you actually think... Well, at the beginning of session, I don't think you would have needed 60 because technically there's no rules that are being operated on at the very beginning of but the it was session a, to adopt the but rules. The, but the Senate was tied and they would have to negotiate, correct? They would have to negotiate with McConnell on that, correct? Because they, because remember, it was 50-50. And there's trillions of dollars to negotiate. Oh, I got you. So I understand. But I, 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 it requires a smart tactician. I got you. To do so, yes. And, I, and what I'm saying is, the point is this here, if you needed 60, 
They weren't going to give you 10 to change the rules to make it easier for you. So what I, what I need our folks to do is also to be aware, which is also why I was going so hard for Barnes and Beasley, because the closer, if we were able to get 52, 53, 54, you actually shrink your totals just a little bit. And that right there is why we need to have people who understand not just politics, but also when somebody says, well, this didn't happen, we need to be deeper than mustard on a hot dog and ask the question, why? What happened? And then, if it did not happen, then say, what needs to happen in the next election with the results to get closer to what our goal is? That's what we actually have to do. Hold on one second. I got to go to a break. We come back. Amanda Seals is up next, discussing her docu-series right here. And we'll also, Trump advisor Pete Navarro. Oh, Lord. This fool, his, his contempt of Congress trial begin today. I love this woman who keeps showing up with a sign over his head. It's awesome when she just taunts his ass. I'm going to show you all that video. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered, the Black Two. Hit the like button. Also, folks, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, join our Brina Funk fan club. So you're checking money order P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zell. Rolling at RolandSMartin.com. Rolling at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, we're going to be talking about common sense. We think that people have it, know how to use it, but it is something that people often have to learn. The truth is, most of us are not born with it, and we need to teach common sense, embrace it, and give it to those who need it most, our kids. So I always tell teachers to listen out to what conversations the students are having about what they're getting from social media, and then let's get ahead of it and have the appropriate conversations with them. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Devon Franklin. It is always a pleasure to be in the house. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. Folks, Savannah Seals, she occasionally discusses politics. She has a new uh, comedy documentary called In Demanda We Trust. She ventures into D.C. to find out there's a place or a space for her to run for political office. Here's a sneak peek 
of this documentary. In a world where deception and power rules, one brave woman answers the call of the people. I think I'm gonna run for office. And ventures to the nation's capital to bring a trusted voice to the halls of democracy. I mean, if I ran, do you think you would vote for me? Yeah. It depends. Oh. oh. It depends. Oh. I came through because I wanted to get some insight from some folks who are already on the inside. And uh, oh, your Afro needed here. <laughs> no one is going to believe me in this. You know what? You never told me. What are you running for? The question really is, what are we running to? I'm running to the people. Ooh. Hey, 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 hey. How well do you think you know government? I went to school. I can answer a couple questions. How are you fighting the colonization? Are you doing martial arts? <laughs> if I were in any office, from alderman to state senator to Republican, I'm like, what Satan just flew into the my Santa's mouth? The came in here, right? That's what and happened. <laughs> In Amanda We Trust, an unapologetically political comedy doc from Amanda Seals, coming soon to the internet. Hear that motorcade? That's Kamala going home. <laughs> that could be me. In AmandaWeTrust.com. All right, Amanda Seals joins us now from New York. Amanda, glad to have you on the show. First and foremost, um, the one thing when you asked the brother, he said, well, I know a couple of things. If there's one thing I think that probably drives me crazy, the number of people who literally have no clue about how politics works in this country. Okay, but Roland, you also are, like, exceedingly knowledgeable about politics. You flexed on me before I even came on camera. He said, I'm mad to talk about politics sometimes, you know, ever so. No, no, no. So, me. no, no, but follow, you know. but follow me here, okay? So, so my, so my, <laughs> look, my parents were grassroots, they were community activists in our neighborhood of Clinton Park in Houston. And so, even as a child, yes, seven, eight years old, standing outside of, of, of election, uh, election day, passing stuff out. But still, it, you got folks who walk around who don't, who don't, and we ask this question all the time. They don't know who their state rep is, state senate, the no. councilman, the county commissioner. Yet then, when folk get mad that stuff don't happen, then you ask them, "Well, who did you call?" Well, I, I, I right. called Congressman so and so. Then you say, "Does he or she actually represent you?" I don't know. And so my problem is that a lot of people respond emotionally when yes. things don't happen, as opposed to factually as to how yes. things get done. That's probably what drives me crazy the most. But you also know that that's by design, right? Like, it's by design that folks are kept ignorant. It's by design that folks are kept feeling like the politics and government of it all exists in an ivory tower. You know, there's just this effort that has been made to create apathy, to, you know, really distract folks from even feeling like they have any level of power. And so that's what I love about what you do. I love about what you do is that you um, you really make it people's responsibility that they need to get it together, they need to get the knowledge, and they need to stop just throwing things around that they don't know about. And that's what this uh, political comedy documentary is about. It's about trying to use humor and use comedy right. to get folks engaged, you know, to get folks at least even curious. I mean, Roland, we are in the age of idiocy. Oh, yeah. We are in an era where being, being ignorant is, is... And people will stand on that and look at you crazy for even seeking knowledge. So that's what this is about. I, I apologize for the sermons. It's, it's a very New York evening. <laughs> oh, I got you. Well, well the thing is, uh, again, so when, when it comes to... Uh, the documentary, and then you, you know, you see, you're coming to DC, and you're talking to the very people. See, that's the thing that that is important. I, I think we do have to. I've been saying this that we got to have Schoolhouse Rock 2.0, 3.0, uh, because when I hear people talk about how frustrated they are, things don't get done, yes. and then when yes. I ask them stuff, and then I go, "You do know that's the school board's job?" Then they go. Hold up. They I'm don't. like, I'm like, that's not Congress. Roland, that's just we got to start from scratch. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we, you, we, you understand we, what I'm saying? Yeah. We, we got to start from scratch. Like, you already stated that you learned from scratch. You started when you were seven and eight by having just juxtaposition to this information. It's the same way that, like, you got to have books in babies' rooms even before they can read them. Yep. Because it needs to be commonplace that knowledge is around you, right? We don't have that civic part of our culture anymore. 
And so many of our ancestors, and even just not even ancestors, our great grandparents, our grandparents worked for that. They fought for that. They died for that. And so what we somehow, uh, not somehow, through great effort, we have been disconnected from that. And so we got to reconnect to that. And those of us who see it, it is our responsibility to be it. And so that's, you know, that's why I made this and I made it with my own money. I mean, that's, you know, I, I love what you do because you was like, man, bump y'all, I'm gonna just do this. And yep. so that is how, <laughs> but that's how it gets done because if you have to rely on the other sources, it, it, it's gonna get, it's gonna get dismantled. It's gonna get muddled. It's gonna get, uh, you know, just dissolved into BS. And so, so as anybody who knows my work, that's yep. what I'm about. So where is this going to air and then what do what's going to happen afterwards? Are you are you talk, thinking about so, saying, hey, let's take it around the country and literally have you know? Yes. Uh, ha look, they got yes. Prager U, so how about so, uh, Seals U, Amanda U, <laughs> Amanda Academy? Um, you know, I was originally just going to do this and be done with it and, and move on and go do a stand up tour, et cetera. And then I was meditating on it and I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm actually not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to live with this and work with this and teach with this. And so this is available on my platform, on my Patreon. So you can go to inamandawetrust.com. And I am going to package this uh, and be able to take this on the road where I will begin with political trivia and stand up. Then we'll watch the special um, and or the documentary, I should say. And then we'll do a Q&A because I, like you, understand that we have to canvas in many ways. We're not just canvassing to get people to vote. We got to can canvas to get people to learn. We got to canvas to get people involved. And it has to be all of us, not just some of us. And so I'm, I'm taking it on the road. I mean, I would love to bring it to schools in 2024. I'd love to get, you know, some of these folks that are, you know, private money philanthropists to fund me being able to bring this to spaces, to do this work. Um, and that's really something I feel very passionate about. So passionate that I'm walking around New York City in, in heels. Just in a suit in summer. I mean, come on, baby, that's commitment. See, I think so. So here's the deal. So uh, I, I think, as, as you were talking, I think what would be great. And so as you're going around, maybe in certain cities, and you have uh, special guests, uh, people who who also who are in this and do this. Uh, yes. we, we got other groups out there, uh, and yes. you know, look, you know, I, I look, I belong to as I'm rocking this. You know, the Coders and exactly. Bowers fraternity. We know who's gonna show up <laughs> more than any other fraternity. There are youth groups, and there's us. <laughs> Let's just be clear. Gotcha. <laughs> and so, let's just be real clear. Uh, there's, a, there's a panelist on this show who belongs to one of those youth groups. We know, we know his folk would not show up in mass numbers. We know who will. But, 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 but I do think, literally, creating this, yeah, as, like, Amanda Academy, because I'm telling you, I, I, Amanda, I, I have traveled this country, and the number of people who literally don't know... And you yeah. tell them, and they look at me like, are you Roland, serious? I didn't know. Roland, I didn't know. I, I went to Columbia for grad school in African-American studies. I was taught by the, by the great Manny Marable and, and Farrah Jasmine Griffin. Like, I, I've had access to some of the greatest educators that have touched foot here, and I didn't know. And I had to gather myself because I was like, you know, you, you, you just as bad as these people out here. You complaining, but you don't even understand. And that is not intellectualism. And it's not responsibility and it's not community. And so I had to check myself and educate myself. And that began with, you know, really following folks like you and, and curating my social media to include uh, informative sites. There that you go. Give, you understand? There that you go. Feed me, that feed me the information and the knowledge and that, that I can actually, like, use my critical thinking. I had to seek out information. Y'all, I even got the flashcards that they make for folks trying to take the citizenship test, okay? Wow! I was like, <laughs> yes, because I but was that, like, no, you you need to start from scratch. And see that? See, it. see, it's interesting. So people people think I take shots at the folks. I don't. Like a brother, a brother the other day put a video out trying to explain why Tyler didn't get BET, and I saw the video, and a bunch of people had spread it around, and I sent him a DM, and I said, "Bro, I saw your video." Wasn't shit you said in your video that was correct. Nothing. It was all you don't wrong. You know how things work. 
Now, he never, he never hit me back, but I do that when I'm like, <laughs> I, but, 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 because see, what angers me is bad information. Yeah. Bad information, like literally, causes me to want to strangle the shit out of somebody. It's infuriating. Because if somebody gets bad information, then they start spreading bad information. Yes. Now we got to stop another 100 people. And I think yep. when it comes to politics, that's one of the things that drives me crazy. Uh, we're going to ask some questions from our panelists. Uh, Rebecca, you first. Hey, Amanda. Thank you so much for being on here tonight. Um, so tell us how, in your perfect world, how would you convince people to get involved with civics? How do you actually make civics entertaining and interesting for people actually to want to care? Because um, I think it's great that you got the flashcards, but how do we get the masses to want to um, care and be involved as well? Well, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge your eyebrows because you did that. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know that. Okay. Um, you know, I think we have to meet people where they are, right? And not, not everybody is in the same place. So, you know, you all, what you all do here is a certain energy and it meets people at a certain space. What I do on stage is I use comedy. Yep. You know, I use relatability and that meets people at a certain space. You know, you have folks that use music. You know, there's going to be a multi-pronged approach that has to be taken, and it has to be taken with intention. And that's what I'm really trying to say with this project and, you know, connect with other people on as well, because not all spaces are, are feeling like it is their responsibility to go with that intention. So you guys work in a space that is very clear and it's very direct. But in comedy, it's not like it's very clear and direct that, like, we should be using this platform to use and to edutain people, right? Like, that doesn't necessarily have a built-in factor in this space, but it is something that I feel very strongly about. So I think at the end of the day, to answer your question, it really is about identifying the different pockets of people and how to get to them and who is in those pockets already that is capable. Because the other thing is we keep asking people questions that don't really know what they're talking about, like like Mr. Martin said, like rappers. Oh my God. Oh Lord, don't trust me. Oh Lord. Ooh, don't even get me started. <laughs> don't even get me started. Okay, uh, Robert. Thank you so much for uh, for everything that you're working on. So I, I did have this question. I've noticed that on the conservative side of the aisle, they've kind of cut out the middleman uh, between the uh, yeah. entertainment community and politics. You know, Donald Trump got elected basically to tell you, telling your mama jokes for a year and a half, and they made him president. Uh, Vivek Ram, yeah, Vivek Ramswani is basically doing a Borat routine right now, where I'm pretty sure you're going to see at the end that this was all a joke. Ronald Reagan was a B movie actor. That being said, do you think instead of you trying to educate people? Maybe to use uh, your platform and just run and be in the arena, as uh, Teddy Roosevelt said. Baby, I don't think I'm built for the arena. Um, I think Donald I would Trump get was a reality real show quick. host. No, no, I mean that I, I, I will. I will punch somebody. You hear me? The way that these people <laughs> behave, I know myself and I know my rage, and so I feel it is better. Uh, refined on the outside. But I will say this, I do believe that there is a requirement that it's going to take folks from both sides. I'm not a reformist, but I do understand that it's going to take from both from folks on the inside and the outside. Yep. What you're talking about is charisma. And what, what, the, what so many of the Democrats haven't sought out is charisma, but they've sought out white approval. And so what they're realizing at this point is that that's not going to cut it. And so much of the apathy is coming from not just people who don't give a damn, but from white people who don't trust. So at this point, we need to change course and we need to get folks that we can believe because that's the difference. The Republicans don't care about that. They just care about folks that can say whatever needs to get said. They to get care the about winning. To do what they need to do. That's it. Yeah, exactly. They'll just say whatever they need to get said. But progressives don't follow that line. So we've got to take a different approach. And it's going to take people who really mean what the F they say. I mean what I say. But I'm not made for politics. I'm made for the stage. Well, you know what? I, do, uh, yep. what I need 2024, to do. I mean what I said. No, no, no. You I think... Got the campaign slogan. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the reason, Amanda... The, the reason I totally agree with you, people... Look, since I was 24, every city I've lived in, I've been asked to run for something. And I'm like, y'all, that ain't me. Because I'm the same... I, I said it. I could probably start off with 20,000 votes and end up with 4,000. Because I'm going to cuss a bunch of people out. Yes. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, if a voter yes. came to me and they said, <laughs> what you going to do about our schools? And I would go, are you a parent? Yes. Are you in the PTA? No. Well, shut the fuck up. See, I, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, I, I mean, I would cuss a parent out 
asking me as a politician what they gonna do about their schools if your sorry ass can't even join the PTA <laughs> and your kid goes to that school. See, right there, I'm gonna lose all the votes in that house. <laughs> It's time coming down. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I know. I'm going to cuss the voter out. I mean... I, no, you're not wrong. See, you're... I don't know that I would cuss the voters out. I would. I look at what Justin Pearson... I look at what Representative Pearson and Representative Jones are dealing with in Tennessee. And I would have been Solange in the elevator had one of them fools come in my face telling me I don't belong here. So I just already know right. that I am not... I am not cut for that. But what I am cut for is doing whatever I can yep. with my intellect, my, my platform, um, and my voice to lend to this cause that we need to understand is imperative. You said something in the panel earlier. We are in a state of crisis, and I don't think enough people think that, and I know enough smart people don't think Boom. that. But I see it. Absolutely. All right, Martha's being your Scott Bolden. <laughs> Hey, Amanda, uh, my name is Cap Alpha Psi Incorporated. And don't I'm nobody care about yeah, that, about that little youth group. <laughs> don't nobody care about that little youth group. <laughs> I, I really do want to ask the question, and, and Roland doesn't have to be a politician to curse you out, trust me. But what, what, are, the three thing, what are the three things you've learned in making this docu-series, and what are you going to do with those things that you've learned? What I learned, one thing that I learned is that a lot of people don't truly understand the way the three branches of government actually work. Um, they don't even necessarily know what they are. And so, so many people are focused on the president and have no true understanding that it is actually the Supreme Court that has got us here. Um, and in many, many iterations, right? Whether it's from Reconstruction to now. So that was one thing that I learned. Another thing that I learned is that these politicians really don't be knowing what's going on. Like, they really don't know how this works. <laughs> like, even the, even the people inside yep. don't know how this works. You know? So when I when I did in Amanda We Trust and we got to interview, you know, Ilhan Omar, Representative Bowman, and rep sorry, Representative Omar, Representative Bowman, and uh, we spoke to some other folks, you know, we really got to... I, I was really taken by the fact that this is convoluted for them. And they're in this year-round. Yep. So it's like, well, if it's, if it's convoluted for y'all, then what must it be like for us on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So that begins mm -hmm. that begins my mindset of, like, how do we undo the puzzle? How do we simplify the puzzle? That's my gift. My gift is using comedy and common sense to explain complex concepts and bring it down, break it down to the bone bristle. That's my gift. And so that's what I am working to do. My third thing that I learned is that it really does matter uh, how you look. <laughs> like, in D.C., <laughs> You know, you can't be up in there looking raggedy. They really not gonna let you in. And so I really, I really was surprised to hear that that was not something I was just like, you know, surmising from the outside. But that optics really are matter, really matter. And I had no idea. The bonus is I had no idea that there was a seersucker day uh, in Congress. <laughs> but it makes sense because there's a lot of suckers in Congress. <laughs> well, Amanda, first of all, well, thank you. When, you, when, when you're ready, <laughs> when you're ready to take this around the country, do understand. Oh my goodness! Look do understand. <laughs> what are you do doing, Jimmy? Amanda? Do understand. <laughs> do understand. What are you doing that to me, that the hat under the desk. Do under now, Doc. I, I I was gifted this in Birmingham a couple weeks ago. So when you travel around the country, uh, oh, and we God. do this here. Uh, I'll be happy to join you for a few of those conversations, and I guarantee you, the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated uh, will be there in full force with, with, with our uh, with our uh, voteless people as a hope, hopeless people campaign. <laughs> and so, again, uh, Scott Bolden, this is a real fraternity right here. We don't play. Amanda, tell everybody. I'm just hey, you let, your shield around. Hey, I'm carrying your shield around. Now, Doc, it sit right there on that shelf, just so you know. <laughs> just so you know. And it sits, wait a minute, it sits right above <laughs> that John H. Johnson Media Award <laughs> I was <laughs> given, who was who founded Ebony <laughs> Magazine, who was an <laughs> alpha. The doc like, 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 Hey, 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 the rest, the rest of y'all want to talk, get your own damn show. The documentary is called In Amanda We Trust. Amanda, tell everybody where they can go watch it. 
You can go to inamandawetrust.com if you want to bring me to your school, your university, your business, et cetera, your community. You can go to amandaseals.com and go to the contact page. Uh, this is an independent project that was produced from my pockets and from my heart for the people. So hopefully you all will support. Uh, well, we're going to push it on social media. Anything, uh, need any more help, holler at a brother. We'll hook you up. Because uh, trust okay. me, we got to get out. I keep telling we are in a period of voter education between now yes. and I yes. say the end of September next year, so the next 12 months, a total focus on voter education. Yes. Please let me know how I can be a part of, of that with you. Please. Gotcha. All right. Will do. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks a bunch. Bye -bye. All right. Right here. Scott Bolden, real fraternity. Real fraternity. I'm leaving the show early. I'm leaving the show early. I cannot take it anymore. The cowboy hat and the shield. That's too much. I've had it up to here. Wide shot, Henry. Wide this shot. Right here. Right here. Up tonight. <laughs> right here. Right here, baby. Everybody, everybody ain't able. All right, y'all. Got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to tell you about some uh, other news. Plus, uh, we're going to talk to Isaac Hayes III about his uh, app fan base. But also, I want Isaac to explain to these simple Simons who don't understand music, publishing, streaming, because, again, I saw a video today of one of these dudes bitching and moaning, complaining about how Diddy gave him the publishing back and how he wants the money and the publishing ain't worth nothing. Maybe because don't nobody listen to your music. I'm just saying. Just saying. So we're going to discuss all of that. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, a production from an alpha. We are your daddy, Scott Bolden. Back in a moment. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Brown versus the Board of Education. The history books call it the court decision that ended racial segregation in American schools. But a brand new book, Jim Crow's Pink Slip uncovers a devastating unintended consequence of that 1954 Supreme Court decision. We may, if we were lucky, have That's been right. the very last generation of Black students to have experienced these generations of Black teachers who have never been replaced. Dr. Leslie Fenwick joins us to talk about her book and the actions following that landmark decision that dealt a virtual death blow to Black educators. That's next on The Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Proud. Hi, I'm Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder, Disney Plus. And I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. <laughs> Navarro, former advisor to Donald Trump, his contempt of Congress trial began today. And y'all know every time he stays outside of court, uh, complain to the media, it's always this white woman 
who's behind him. Uh, first of all, prosecutors call him arrogant as hell. Um, arrogant as hell. Uh, and, and said that he just felt like he could just flout the rules. And so uh, he, he, he talked yesterday. Roll a video from yesterday, y'all. Oh, my God, this video is hilarious. Check this woman out. Listen. Thank you. Uh, WW. This is um, this is what's wrong with America here. www.defendpeter.com. Defend. Let him talk, man. It's great. It, he, he has every right to talk. Come on, come on, don't Thank do you, that, sir. man. No, let, let the man traitor. talk, man. Let the traitor. man talk. Please, Please play this let him talk. Let on your, on your talk. channels. Because this right? is just wrong. I'm trying to let speak about serious constitutional issues with you. Clown with a whistle, witch with a broom. Martin you go Taylor figure. <clears throat> so, uh, defendpeter.com. Please go there, help support this fight against uh, the attack on the separation of powers. These money, trials are very money, money. expensive. Peter's using my image to grip off me. Send me money. Continue. These, uh, these trials are very expensive. That's part of the Democrats' lawfare against us. All right, come on, dude. Come on, dude. Yeah, it's time to go. All right, we'll see you tomorrow, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, free speech. versus outside because there's nothing he can do about the hecklers. There's nothing he can do about them. And it's just not funny. I actually kind of feel sorry for him. I don't. I don't feel sorry. Rebecca, I don't feel sorry for his... Rebecca, I don't feel... No, hell no. Rebecca, I don't feel sorry for his punk ass because that's how he actually treated other people in the White House. That's how he treated people on television. He's getting a dose of his own medicine. Well, it I just love ain't it. Right. I mean, it just ain't right, Roland. <laughs> Look, I, I love it. I think she's using her powers for good. I mean, I want to see more white women allies like this <laughs> right, actually using right. their care, the potential Karen ways, and do the right thing. I don't understand what that black guy was doing. He has a sign saying he's a truth conductor. I don't understand that. He could have <laughs> just stayed out of the frame and just let this <laughs> let this whole thing play out. I mean, I love it. Like, even last week when she was talking about situational awareness, I've been here the entire time. You need to pay attention. Like, I I'm, I'm here for it. Robert, he cannot go. This is the First Amendment. She's practicing the same amendment. Uh, uh, that black dude wearing the same outfit as Stephen from the Django Unchained? Because I guarantee you, if you look back, that is the exact same outfit the Samuel Jackson was wearing in Django. Like, look at it. That, that, is, that is the Django outfit. He is, he is the, that, the, out there to defend his man, Peter, and he got the outfit on and the vest and everything. Uh, and look, the, 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 the solution to this has a press conference inside and just have right. it fight only. If you're going to do it on a public street and the public airways, this woman has free speech, just like you can't tell a, a cab to not drive by or someone not to honk a horn or a siren. You can't tell these people to be quiet. But I, I think that people need to understand that these people in the Trump orbit are millionaires and can't afford criminal defense in this country. And while it's funny 
when we're talking about them. There's a real problem with indigent defense in America. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are un uh, unable to afford to defend yep. themselves in a court of law. We have to reform our criminal justice system. It's not just a simple question of police reform. We have to reform the system from the inside out. When you have a billionaire, quote unquote, like Donald Trump having to beg for money and Rudy Giuliani and all these other people in order to pay for their legal defense, it's to tell you the system is broken. Listen, all I want is somebody to walk in with a little sign and say, pee the balls a little bitch! <laughs> you, th you there, Rolly, you can do it. If anybody, hey, 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 listen, if any of y'all in D.C. <coughs> get a sign and stand by and just saw you, pee the balls a little bitch! I will run it on the show. I'm just letting y'all know I will run it on the show. All right, y'all, let's go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the cop who shot and killed uh, Patrick Loyola point blank in back of the head during a routine traffic stop. He's asking the state appeals court to throw out the murder charge against him. Earlier this year, a lower court denied Christopher Scherr's motion to dismiss the second-degree murder charge which took place April 4, 2022, when he killed Ly uh, 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 Lioa. The defense argues that the Kent County Circuit Judge erred in his decision allowing the charge to stand. The defense team says Michigan law permitted Officer Scherr to use deadly force to prevent Lioa from fleeing and to execute his arrest under legal authority given to the officer by the state of Michigan. Scherr maintains he feared for his life and shot Lioa in self-defense. Lioa's family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, folks, uh, in our next story, and this one here, of course, uh, is uh, out of New York. A black man got the best birthday present, present ever. Y'all, this is unbelievable. This man has been sitting in prison since 1975 when he was convicted of sexual assault. Now DNA has cleared Leonard Mack. Again, he was wrongfully convicted for rape weapon possessions, making him the longest standing wrongful conviction in U.S. history. In May 1975, two teenage girls were attacked while walking home from school. One was raped and the other found help at a nearby school and described the attacker as a black man in his 20s. Leonard matched the description. He was so overwhelmed with joy, he hugged the judge who exonerated him on his 72nd, 72nd birthday. Literally, Robert, this man spent 40 seven years in prison for a crime he did not commit. And the worst part is he's not the only one. If you, um, part of criminal defense practices, you go to jails, you go to prisons, you win, and as you're talking to your clients, people try to stop you in the hallway. Everyone tries to plead their case to you and explain that they're, they've been wrongfully convicted and there's, no, there's not enough resources available uh, to be able to get these people out. And also, the system is not equipped to compensate people. How do you compensate somebody for a half century of their life being gone? How do you properly compensate people uh, people for uh, losing, uh, for not seeing their children grow, to seeing their families uh, 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 pass away while they're in custody for crimes they haven't committed. We have a problem with the criminal justice system here in America. This is an example of it. I was on um, Russian TV yesterday talking uh, talking about this issue, that while we are uh, going around the world spreading democracy, trying to set up court systems, accusing other people of war crimes, we have not yet cleaned up our own house here in America. And this, uh, when we talk about creating this agenda for African Americans in this country for the 2024 election, that has to be on the agenda, reforming this system. The Innocence Project can only do so much. Nonprofits can only be do so much. We have to have a federal initiative in place to help exonerate many of these people and review these cases that it sometimes are decades old. That's the only way we'll get justice for these individuals. Probably we have, Rebecca, you've got these conservatives across the country who do not like these progressive DAs who create these units to re-examine old cases. Too often, you have these hardcore, um, hard political uh, prosecutors who say, throw the key away, and we're not going to re-examine old cases. And we saw this happen with Craig Watkins in Texas. We saw this with Marilyn Mosby. We saw this happen uh, in uh, St. Louis uh, with uh, Kim Gardner. And these people say, oh, these are soft on crime. No, they want to make sure that people were convicted, the right folks are in prison. 
You know, and we also have to support prosecutors who are interested in doing the right thing and actually creating task force in order to review cases, you know, and then when they do run for office like Kamala Harris or other people similar, then not demonize them for like the positive changes that they try to do on behalf of the people just because they were on the prosecution side. Um, but th this it's, it's actually sad to watch because I think of that gentleman who is near my dad's age and I think about um, just like all that life that he was deprived of living. I think about his family and friends who are deprived of, uh, of living that particular life with them. And so while I am happy, but I'm also very sad that this is our system. And I, I don't even think it could be called a criminal justice system yep. because I don't see the justice in our system. Uh, indeed. Let's talk about Los Angeles, where a second former L.A. County Sheriff's deputy will plead guilty to violating a man's civil rights at a Compton skate park by improperly detaining him and then acting to cover up his actions. <laughs> Miguel Ange uh, uh, Angel Vega admitted he falsely imprisoned a 23-year-old skateboarder identified in court documents as J.A. in his patrol car, which crashed during a subsequent chase injuring J.A. on April 13, 2020. Vega also admitted to filing false reports to cover up his and his partner, Christopher Blair Hernandez's unlawful conduct. Vega is expected to formally plead guilty next week to the one count of deprivation of rights under color of law and will face up to 10 years in federal prison. His partner, Hernandez, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy in July. His sentencing hearing is set for January 8th. He's facing up to five years in federal prison. This is another win, Scott, for a Biden-Harris DOJ that has been very aggressive in going after cops, putting a number of them in jail, and as I said, prison wardens, jail uh, guards as well. A lot more has happened under this DOJ when it comes to holding cops accountable in prison uh, folks than, frankly, since any administration since Robert Kennedy was uh, attorney general. Yeah, it shows that if you put the energy into it and you're intentional about it, you will weed out, and this is just a fraction of the abuse and the corruption in our police departments across the country. But what's really interesting about this is <clears throat> they got a plea agreement uh, from both of the individuals, at least one, one guy he pled, but this, the main actor, was just egregious conduct. I mean, he, he was challenged to a fight, and then, then they had a fight, and then they arrested him and put him in. I mean, th this was just egregious personal conduct. And I often wonder... How does a police officer graduate from an academy and get to the point where he gets in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal dispute with someone who is minding their own business and he went into this area, this park area, and just challenged this guy and then abused him uh, over and over again? And then his partner, you know, if you had a system where your partner was obligated to report bad police conduct and it affected your pay or it affected your ability to continue to be on the police force. Like, you'd have, like, a rule called my brother's keeper whereby I have to report corruption or bad conduct. Uh, otherwise, you get fired or you get a reduction in pay. You could clean this up. The police and the leadership in the police departments could clean this up right away, but police unions would never allow it. So good for DOJ and good for the good work that they're doing to try to do their best while their leadership uh, at the DOJ and under the Biden administration. Folks in Georgia, whopping 61 folks have been slapped with racketeering charges for stirring up a ruckus against Atlanta's new controversial police training center called Cop City. Republican Attorney General Chris Carr announced the sweeping indictment last week, labeling the defendants as militant anarchists and alleging their support for a violent movement stemming from the 2020 racial justice protests. Five of the 61 are facing charges of domestic terrorism and arson in the first degree. Three others face 15 counts of money laundering. The Atlanta City Council approved legislation in 2021 authorizing a ground lease agreement with the Atlanta Police Foundation to build the training facility. Since its approval, there have been clashes between police and protesters at the future site. Opposition to the facility grew after 26-year-old Emmanuel Tehran was shot and killed during the January 18th raid at the site. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation said Tehran opened fire on troopers as they tried to clear the air. Robert, six, uh, RICO against folks who are protesting? This is not sitting well with a bunch of people in Atlanta. 
at, at Food Cop City is not sitting well with a bunch of people in Atlanta. This is something that was never brought to the people. It was passed in the dead of the night. Um, we're going to see a lot of city council people lose their seats because of uh, Cop City. And this happens again and again. Atlanta calls itself, you know, this chocolate city. But at the end of the day, the money special interest went out every time, whether it's putting a stadium on the uh, on the location of historic black churches, whether it's where you build the belt line at, or even this Cop City situation here. And, and uh, yes, most of the RICO charges are against people who are from out of state, uh, who are uh, part of these uh, environmental groups, et cetera. But part of the problem, I know we, everyone are celebrating the Georgia RICO statute because that's what they're using to prosecute Trump, but it's one of the most expansive RICO statutes in the country. You can be charged, uh, uh, charged with a Georgia RICO violation without ever entering the state, without ever talking to anybody in the state. Uh, it, it's so expansive, they use it almost like a spaghetti test. You throw indictments against the wall, you see how many people you can get to flip, and then you use that for your prosecution. It's very much often a indictment in search of a crime as opposed to the other way around, and it needs to be reformed because just because it works out one time when they're prosecuting the Trump and his nine co-defendants, we can't look uh, ignore the fact that it's been used extensively in the state to bring in the uh, to bring in people who often have not committed criminal conduct as a way to control groups and uh, control uh, any uh, any people who oppose government activities. It's a very scary place we are in a criminal justice system in America, and it has to be reformed on a legislative level. Level. Folks, Philadelphia's first black woman to lead its police department is stepping down from her role later this month. Commissioner Danielle Outlaw started in 2020 amid COVID and interrupting protests. Those prompted criticism from the Philadelphia City Council who called the police response brutal and unacceptable. Philadelphia had to pay out a hefty $9.25 million settlement to hundreds of protesters for actions taken by law enforcement, which Commissioner Outlaw initially defended. Her last day will be September 22nd. She will then become the Deputy Chief Security Officer of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Wow. So, uh, Rebecca, you lose the city a whole bunch of money and then you get a new job. You know, it seems to be a revolving door when it comes to law enforcement moving across um, the country. I think before she came from Portland, or um, Oregon, and then right before the pandemic, she joined... Um, the Philadelphia uh, police force um, um, with leading as commissioner. Um, yeah, you know, good luck to her. All right, folks, uh, got to go to break. We come back. We're going to talk with uh, Isaac Hayes III, who is the founder of Fanbase, about their uh, final raise uh, for the site. But also, I got I want, I want, I want him to school some folks out here who don't quite understand streaming and publishing and rights, things along those lines. And so we're going to chat with him next. Right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. YouTube folks, hit the like button, y'all. should easily be over 2,000 likes. Also, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, you can support us uh, by contributing to our fan club. Your dollars make it possible to do what we do. So your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003-7-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM, Un RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Back in a moment. Up next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes, we're going to talk to Leslie Seagar, a.k.a. Big Les, and talk about her incredible career as a dancer, choreographer, and DJ of Rap City. Magic Johnson was there, so half the NBA was there. Iman the supermodel, so all the supermodels were there every day. After right. Like, it was a who's who of who's who. Right here on The Frequency in the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Black women are starting businesses at the fastest rate than any other segment. However, finding the funding to build them is challenging. On our next Get Wealthy, we're going to talk with author Katherine Finney, who wrote the book, Build the Damn Thing. And she's going to be sharing exactly what we need to do to achieve success in spite of the odds. As an entrepreneur of color, it's first, you know, building your personal advisory board. I think that's one of the things that's helped me the most. The personal advisory board of the people who are in the business of you. 
you personally and want to see you succeed. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. I'm Farai G. Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together. So let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha, from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, uh, fan base uh, is in their final raise as we speak when it comes to uh, crowdfunding uh, to uh, grow the social media app. Uh, Isaac Hayes III, he is the founder of Fanbase. Uh, he joins us right now. Isaac, glad to have you. All right, uh, how much you got left to raise, Isaac? Uh, we have about about 1.5 million left to raise. We just crossed 3.65 million dollars, which is huge. So basically. If 2,500 people invest $600 today, the raise will close. That's really, you know, the, the best way to put it. Um, investing in fan base has really been an enormous uh, success. I've done three of these raises. We've raised over $9.3 million. This is the last, like, seed round I'm doing before we go to Series A because the company's about to go to another level. But I always want to provide the opportunity for people to invest. So we've, we've raised about $3.65 million. Um, and the minimum to invest is $245. So once we get to, once we get to five million, it's a wrap. It's over with. And a thing that, uh, again, when we talk about the likes of Facebook and Twitter and on and Instagram and WhatsApp and all these other apps, I mean, the reality is, if you were just a regular, ordinary person, you, you couldn't invest in these companies. They would go to uh, institutional investors, other rich yeah. folks, uh, and and the folk who truly made money. Uber, the other, they got in early. That's the folks who made money, not after they went public. Absolutely. Think of it as, think of it as a scale. Like the more people that stand on the scale, the higher the value the company goes. And so when it comes to social media, right? So you as a user or an investor have the ability to increase the value of fan base by simply using it. So I always say all the time, um, you should own part of the companies that you're using. These platforms are worth 200 billion. 300 billion, 500 billion with a B, 500 billion dollars with a B. And there are a lot of wealthy people that own part of these companies. But yet, you know, especially kids in the black community is what makes these platforms extremely valuable. But that that wealth never goes into the pockets of the people that actually make the platforms what they are. And it never does. Um, and so when we talk about, again, um, uh, how the site uh, has grown, you launched it when? So we, I built Fanbase in all of 2018, launched in 2019, but I didn't raise capital till November 2020. So we're about almost three solid years um, of being uh, of operating, and, and I, I count us really raising our first round in November and then going into 2021 with capital as when the, the platform really got its wings. Up until then, I was paying for it out of my own pocket. Like, I had spent my own money to, to build it, but it was a learning process that I think worked out well because it brought me to equity crowdfunding. And so we started with 10,000 users at that time. Um, when I started my raise, now Fanbase has over 430,000 users. We're in 212 countries, including, um, and 212 countries on seven continents, including Antarctica, which I joke about. Um, and so we have a large user base that is international, all over the country, Africa. Um, and so again, this is a global platform for people to actually monetize their content, but actually post content for free if they want to. So um, it's a lot of new functionality and features we're adding. Roland, you're gonna love something we just we just added. Actually, we launched on Monday, which was actually Fanbase Plus on web. So think of Fanbase Plus on web as like your Netflix or your YouTube, where you can actually post up to two hours worth of content behind a paywall. And now people can subscribe either on their phone or they can actually subscribe on their desktop computer. So when you think of people being able to monetize podcasts reality shows, talk shows, content creators, cooking, 
all these things. This is a place um, that we want to really make open and free for everybody to just have a direct way for people to monetize their content. Similar to what you're doing with your platform, but we're giving it to the world. We want everybody to be able to do exactly what you do. Um, so monetize on the front end and then actually own part of the company on the back end. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Um, questions uh, from our panelists. Uh, Scott, go. Yeah. Hey, I've uh, been on the show a couple of times, seeing your interviews and stuff. Once you get to the 1.5 million, will there be another round or do you just keep growing? I mean, what's the end game here or is there an end so game for that matter? Yeah, so the end game is a Series A round. And so really what you have yeah. to do with companies like this is they have to reach escape velocity growth. We've been able to build fan base, but after we do this last round, we're going to do something called a Series A round. And a Series A round is where you raise, like, a huge amount of capital because you have to spend money. And I, and I, and I understand that, you know, $5 million is a lot of money, but compared to what platforms like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook spend, it's they probably spend that every day, Right. So right. we have to right. take capital to be able to run this company, but actually be able to hire more employees, C-suite executives, expand our development team, expand our marketing team, because without that capital to really grow, it makes it harder for us to continue to scale. You can always have a moment where you go viral and you grow, but we really want to make sure that we close this round so we go to Series A, and that's when you start looking at institutional investors and credited investors and VCs and stuff like that come in and start to invest. So it's not so much just the general public having an opportunity to invest, but now the people that typically invest in companies to make them grow faster and, and larger, that's when those people come in on a Series A round. So that's escape velocity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Hey, it's good to see you again. Is crowdfunding um, the future for how black businesses um, seek capital? I think so, absolutely. With what's going on with Arian Simone and Fearless Fund, um, I think the way that we fund our businesses through equity crowdfunding is very disruptive. And the reason why is because now we can fund our own products, right? We can fund our own businesses that we have equity in. Um, since I've started raising capital on Start Engine, I've recommended three other startups that have gone on to raise a million dollars themselves and another one that is launching soon. Um, one of them is called the Black Bread Company. If people don't know, there's only one black-owned bread company in your Yeah, we, we, we had them on the show. Exactly. And so, so I recommended Charles Alexander and those guys to Start Engine. They raised a million dollars on Start Engine, and I invested in the Black Bread Company, and then I buy Black Bread Company bread. So... Imagine that, that we're able to own part of social media platforms, uh, food products, any kind of business that you can think of. Equity crowdfunding is extremely disruptive because accredited investors are the only ones that have been able to invest in these early stage companies. An accredited investor, for everybody out there listening, is just AKA rich people, right? Rich people from 1932. So I don't <laughs> care if you were black, white, whoever, if you did not make over $200,000 a year for two years in a row, which is like less than 1% of Americans, or have a net worth of a million dollars minus your house, then it was illegal for you to invest in a Facebook, in Apple, in Instagram, in Uber. It was illegal. That sounds crazy to me because we all could go to Vegas right now, put $5,000 on the crap table. That's not illegal. We could all go buy $5,000 worth of lottery tickets. That's not illegal. But Oren Michaels can put $5,000 into Uber, and then nine years later, it'd be worth $24 million. How come we couldn't do that? So equity crowdfunding gives everybody a seat at the table, and especially in platforms like tech with AI, like we're rolling out AI into our new algorithm, stuff like that. Like owning part, I, I'll tell you right this, I feel that investing in tech startups like this is actually a better investment than like crypto or NFTs, because it's also an asset that you can actually add value to. Like you can control the value of that. You can't control what Bitcoin does, right? But you can control how valuable fan base is or any company that you invest in by telling people to use the product or being supporters or users of it. Robert. Uh, what is your strategy for attracting black content creators uh, to come to fan base? We saw during the pandemic, uh, TikTok was a thing, but it wasn't until black folks started doing little dance routines and stuff, they really blew up into this global sensation it is now. You know, since Elon Musk has taken over Twitter, they lost 66 percent in their uh, advertising base. But the thing that still keeps it alive is really black Twitter. That's the only thing that's alive. It's black Twitter and then white supremacists. I'm not quite sure how they coexist in the same space, but they do. Uh, Elon blamed the Jews for his losing 
using advertising trying to sue the, uh, the Anti-Defamation League. Weird stuff going on. But how can we get all that black intellectual uh, capital and trend-setting and taste-making onto this platform instead of making someone like Elon rich? Well, there are two things that we have to do. One, I think, is if you want to do it that way, we have to be intentional. You literally have to say, hey, I'm going to start using this platform along all the other platforms. I tell everybody, don't get rid of any of your other social media platforms, but start using Fanbase. Add it to the queue. And I know that's that's a little, it might be a little uncomfortable or irritable, but this one matters because Fanbase is the most successful Black-owned startup, social media startup, since <coughs> Black Planet, which was 2000, right? And so there's a bunch of young kids that I think also... Uh, are going to change the the, the the trajectory of fan base because for this reason and this reason alone, younger younger generations are what move the culture. So these young kids, primarily black kids and kids of color, are the ones that create all the cool, create all the trends. And so really, fan base is is the next destination for them because they're not necessarily want to be influencers. They want to be business people. They want to monetize their content. They want to be like Kai Sinat. If anybody doesn't know who Kai Sinat is, who's a, a very popular Twitch streamer, like they're going for the bag. And that those generation of kids are going to make way more money than this previous, influ previous influencer generation because they understand subscription revenue. They understand in-app purchase capability, digital currency, all the things like that. So I think for fan base to scale, we definitely are, are focused on younger users who really want to take the platform and carry it for the next 10 or 15 years. And then the, the overall community of people in general, especially people of color, that just say, hey, look, our value in these platforms is where we can see um, growth in our pockets by investing and being part of it today. Real quick thing, there's a, there's a, there's a part of fan base that we have called um, um, fan base audio, which is very similar to Clubhouse. And Clubhouse made a really big change today. They changed the app and everybody's complaining. And then I got called into a room. They're like, we're moving to fan base. And I'm like, well, you could have moved to fan base a long time ago. And Boom. Like, I'm not, I wasn't saying that to say any, say, say bad, but I'm saying all these years that you've been here, they haven't provided any opportunity for you to monetize. Here's your chance to own a piece of the company then step on that scale. Like I said, cause before you leave, invest before you do anything like if you're going to use the platform cool but there's so many people that have invested 245 dollars into fan base and made that back on the platform so now they're actually invested in a company for free because they made the money by simply using the app to actually make money themselves so it's like a free investment um that a lot that hundreds and thousands of, of investors and users have seen and a whole bunch of us uh, are using Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, putting all our content there, and we ain't making no money. We're making them rich. I just saw a dude today. I just saw a guy. He said he had 1.2 million views on TikTok, and he got $19. Mm. And I was like, mm. and I did the math. TikTok pays between, like, one and two cents per thousand views. If you do the math on that, that's about right. So I understand why he made that money, but... Um, Again, subscriptions are the future. There's no difference between Roland and Disney Plus. The only difference is Disney Plus is paying $100 million for a season of whatever they make, and Roland's producing the content himself. And so, therefore, people want to watch what they want to watch. So there's no difference. So what I'm saying is the future is democratization of content distribution. So everybody's going to be their own channel. That's the future. It's not going to be we're going to Netflix and Disney Plus. It's going to be we're going to Roland Martin. We're going to Fanbase. We're going to this artist, this this uh, uh, e economic advisor, this uh, entertainer to receive our content and subscribe the same way, not for hundreds of dollars a month, but five dollars a month well it's nine dollars a month yeah it's so, like that's the future it's like one of the reasons i tell people um i've had people say oh man you know i had this guy who's like well you know uh you ain't making nothing on youtube i was like mm, actually you're lying um and like what you just said so how much is it uh, per one thousand on tiktok probably about uh, between one and two cents per thousand views so per one thousand views on tiktok one and two cents I just checked for the our 28 day average, uh, the revenue for every 1,000 views on YouTube is $9.64. So yeah. I, I, I'm like, y'all, it comes down to the money. And what, 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 what fan base allows is for if you have 10, 20, 30, 50,000, 100,000 fans, you take a, a country Wayne, okay, who had a deal with Facebook, now he's back on Instagram, he's also been on YouTube. The reality is, if his fans say, hey, I love this video. Boom, I'm going to give you some hearts. 
Again, he's making money from that. The reality is it's a bunch of people right now. They are posting stuff every day, multiple times a day. They're posting stories, posting reels, and they're making zero. 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 And you're, you're, and what it is is you're creating content for the platform to run ads in between. So every time you post something, they run an ad behind it. So you don't even get really any of that ad revenue. Some of the creators do, but the overall general public, the 2 billion monthly active users on Instagram don't get any of that money. So what I'm saying is for what we do on Fanbase is everybody is a business. My definition of a business is the ability to receive income for a service or a product that you provide. That means by default, every single person that has a fan base page has the ability to receive income for the content that they create. There's nobody that's not a business on fan base. There's, no, there's nobody stopping anybody from the other 212 countries from clicking a couple buttons and saying, I'm subscribing to you for $2.99, $4.99, $9.99, $19.99 a month, right? And then you get 50% of that revenue and then you can build a business off that. I'll simply say this, 5,000 people paying you $2.50 a month is $12,500 a month. That's $150,000 a year. That's more than 97% of Americans make. And as a, as a 100% more you're gonna make on Instagram. All right, so, uh, yeah. so I, I saw this video today where one of the artists um, who got his publishing back with Diddy, he was yeah. bitching and moaning and complaining yeah. and stuff like that. And I saw you comment on it because he was like, "Oh, this this pu this is trash. This is not gonna earn me. I want Diddy send me the money." And I was listening to him, and he was complaining about, "Oh, no one wants these songs." Well, first of all, dude, if you didn't make a hit, that ain't on us. I go to my iPad, and so uh, the story came out: Sean Diddy Combs reassigns music publishing rights to bad boy artists, including yeah. Notorious B.I.G., Mace, and Faith Evans. Now, a bunch of people, Isaac, are like, oh, this ain't nothing but just PR for Diddy. This is, a, this is nothing. It means nothing. He's raped them for all these years and making the money. Now, uh, it's worthless. As somebody who's the son of the great Isaac Hayes, and mm -hmm. what you did not do was just sell off his rights like other people, other people have cashed out. Explain why this matters and how the artist can actually benefit economically. Okay, so I'm not gonna, this isn't a knock against what Diddy did, but regardless of whether he wanted to do it or not, copyright law has copyrights terminating after 35 years. So whoever owns your publishing after 1978, from the moment that you wrote a song, let's say you wrote a song in 2000, the year 2000, in 2035, the publishing's coming back to you regardless. There's nothing that can stop that anyway. So what Diddy's probably done is given artists their publishing back a few years, you know, five, six, seven years before it was gonna come back anyway. Right. So he's just saying you guys can have it now because copyright law just returns the copyright to the publisher regardless, right? Unless it was purchased outright in some sort of deal, and most of the time it doesn't, it hasn't worked like that anyway. So um, what I think it was um, Mark Curry, what Mark Curry doesn't understand is that before when your song was sold in a record store, once people stopped going to record stores, the sales of your song plummeted. You never would make a penny off them again. Streaming has given an infinite life to every song that's ever existed by people being able to find and discover your music and listen to it. So mm -hmm. you see songs from 10, 15 years ago, like Sure Thing by Miguel going viral. That song came out in 2009. It started, it just went viral this year in 2023. Wow. So imagine a song you wrote in 2009, all these kids discover in 2023, and you've made more money than you ever made in this year than you did <clears throat> the 15 years before you wrote the song. That's what Mark Curry doesn't understand. Songs that his name is on could go viral. On top of that, um, the Copyright Association of America lost, um, I mean, won a settlement against all the streaming uh, services to increase the royalty rate that they pay at, which used to be 10.5 cents. To By the time it's 2027, it'll be 15.35 cents, I mean, 15.35 percent of streaming. So that's like a 65 percent increase in royalties. So if you made a dollar, right, off streaming, by 2027, you'll make a dollar fifty. So if you make a million dollars, you're gonna make 1.5 million dollars. If you make, you know, what I'm saying 10 million, you'll make 15 million. So it's an enormous increase. Um, it should be more, and hopefully it will be more. But he doesn't understand that. Um, 
there's an infinite life cycle now to publishing. You, you never know when somebody's going to take your dance and make it go viral on social media. Somebody's going to use it in a commercial. So I think he's a little short-sighted on what he said. And it might be a little just, you know, sour grapes there. And I can understand that that happens with artists in the music business all the time. But he's absolutely wrong about it doesn't have any value because all these hedge funds wouldn't be going around trying to buy catalogs, including everybody that tried to buy my father's catalog like crazy and spend millions and millions of dollars to get it if there was no value in the publishing. And and the thing is, when you talk about the publishing game, how about Mark Curry? You should be pushing your music for folks who ain't never heard of you. Because yeah. they might go, yo, I like that. I mean, you're absolutely right. The other day, I was sitting here, I, I heard a song. I don't know where in the hell I was. And again, I hear music all the time. I hear music in the store, in the mall. I hear, I might yeah. hear it in a commercial. I think I looked it up and I was like, yo, that came out in 93? And I'm, here I am playing it over and over and over again on Apple Music. Shazam. Shazam is what does it. It's the ability to, so music is now like, it's infinite because the only way I could discover an old song is I'd have to go to the mom and pop store, dig through the crates, pull the out, put up, you know what I'm saying? Find the find the CD or the eight track or whatever or the or the record and listen to it. Now all I can do is click a button and type a name in. The Platters, you know, Otis Redding, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you know, like that Billy Holiday, like, and then once I listen, though that money, that that money goes to those artists or whoever owns the publishing. So again, people having that publishing back. Um, is enormous, and then like, like like again, you don't know who's gonna, you don't know if Drake's gonna take a, a, one of the songs that Mark Curry wrote on it, and put in one of his records, and make it this phenomenal hit record that goes crazy and makes millions of dollars too. So, no, publishing is the gift that keeps on giving. I call it musical real estate. You own it until you sell it. It has an infinite, like it has a value. And anytime somebody wants to come and build something on top of your real estate, they have to pay you. So every time somebody wants to sample one of my father's records, they have to pay us, and then we get a portion of the new property. So that new song makes a million dollars, and we say we want 25% of that, and we get $250,000 of that song. So I think he's short-sighted. He doesn't understand. And I think, you know, he, he's part of some records that I think will, will make a, a good amount of money. He just doesn't know it yet. Uh, it's amazing. When you don't know, you don't know. Uh, yep. For the folks, for the folks uh, who want to invest uh, in a fan base, where do they go? They go to startengine.com slash fan base, right? Um, say that one more time, startengine.com slash fan base. Uh, the minimum to invest in fan base is $245. Um, it's an amazing opportunity. And this, like, once I say about evaluation is, once this round closes, fan base is valued at $85 million. That was the valuation that fan base was valued at September of last year. Once this round closes, we've added over 200,000 users this year, I think, alone. So fan base's value is not going to be $85 million in Series A. It's going to be way more than that. And so I keep telling people, don't don't miss out on the opportunity to actually own part of this company. <coughs> I'm extremely confident in what the team is building. It's a very solid product. The tech is sensational. Um, we got new functionality added all the time. So again, photo, video, live stories, audio chat, long form video, up to two hours. Um, anybody can make a, a profile or a page. It's free to download, free to use. It's on iOS and Android invest you know like i said 600 i said 2500 people investing 600 dollars gets us to 1.5 million dollars so that's uh you know what i'm saying we could do that today and when i do programs like these the word kind of gets out and i'm doing a couple other programs uh, tomorrow and stuff like that so i'm really you know focusing on closing this raise going right into the fall into series a so I, I just, before we go i just gotta ask a couple of quick questions somebody said if you invest in fan base are you obligated to use it Yo ass should be using it. You using shit right now for free you ain't investing in. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, I'm, look, I'm not... I'm obligated, I, but, but it, would, it would be in your best interest, too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna call out Grace Wisher's name. <laughs> look, I mean, investing, in, investing is something, I mean, <laughs> Grace might be somebody that's not into social media, but looks at fan base... She commenting on a YouTube chat right now. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Well, then, yeah, she's on YouTube then. But, but she might not be a social media user, but she can still invest. It doesn't, I mean, look. I know that. I'm just saying, but Grace, yes, Grace, if you invested in it, use it. Yeah, Oops. Grace. All right. So somebody else uh, had a comment. Uh, let me find this damn comment. Uh, they like, oh, I ain't going to get called out right now. Um, and so uh, it, was a, it was another question about, oh, okay. I, folks, somebody said, if I invest... How long will it take for I to get my money back? Folks, 
this is, you're making an investment. There's no guarantee you're getting your money back. But here's the right. key. You want this, you're taking a risk, but you want it to mature. And so yeah. that the people who bought Apple stock early and held onto it, people who bought Nike stock, they worth a whole lot because they, they didn't they, they didn't sell and get, uh, get rid of it. And one of the mistakes historically, Isaac, that African Americans have made, a lot of people people don't know that John H. Johnson had the cable rights in Chicago. Percy Sutton had the cable rights in New York City. They sold those franchises early. They, had they held on, if, had Percy Sutton or, uh, or John H. Johnson said, you know what, let's build it from here, they could be today's Comcast. Oh, yeah. Or Spectrum. So we just got to understand, is that all? You got to think long term. Final comment, go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, in, investing is a, is a long term game. Um, especially in seed stage startups. I think the people that bought Apple stock, they still probably have their stock. Even if they sell some of it, let's say you had $100,000 worth of stock or $5,000 worth of stock in the 80s and now it's worth $50 million. Okay, I'm going to sell $2 million of it and put that in my pocket. I still got $48 million worth of wealth. I think people don't understand how the game works and that's why I really love equity crowdfunding because it gives people a seat at the table that they never consider. They don't want you in the room. They don't want you to own part of... Instagram and Uber and stuff like that because the, the rich opportunities are, 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 are usually left for the wealthy. This is an every man's game. You know, equity crowdfunding is an every man's opportunity. Fan base is an every man's opportunity. I don't care what race you are, what age you are. This is your chance to own part of it. Yep. it like I said, it's a, it's a so more solid investment than crypto. I'll tell you that much. It's a more solid investment than NFTs. I'll tell you that much. And people are throwing millions and millions of dollars of that. This is actually a, a product that you can download and use and actually make money on the front end and then have equity on the back end. And if you don't feel like fan base is something that you'll use, tell your kids about it. And if they don't use it, tell them to tell their grandkids about it. Trust me. Somebody can't... 10 years from now, it'll, it'll, it'll... 10 years from now, fan base will be one of the top media companies in the world, in the entire planet. You'll remember these conversations because this is how all these companies start. They start very small, very hungry, very disruptive, and very aggressive. Well, I, I invested, and I got to end it on this one here. Uh, and, and Scott, Scott, don't choke on this one. Uh, Rebecca, don't choke. This person, uh, BB, said, I'm not on any social media. Uh, I, th this is just, y'all just, do y'all understand? I'm not on any social media because I don't have time for it. Cool. And just invest $245. No, 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 no. Your friend. This is about what they type in the chat room in, on YouTube. That's <laughs> social media. No, no, and yeah. you have time for it. Okay. All right. Isaac, I... <laughs> hey, I'm just saying. Isaac, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, man. Uh, Robert, thanks a bunch. Rebecca, thanks a bunch. Uh, Lil Kappa, thanks a bunch. Uh... <laughs> Uh, you just say my name. Say my name. Say my name. Aloysius Scott Bolden. <laughs> Your ass want to come on here talking about A. Scott. A. Scott that's Bolden. Some, that's some bougie shit. I mean, can we, just go, can we just go ahead and say that's some bougie shit? I mean, well, Rebecca, how many black people who are not preachers do you know walk around going, my initial, it's A. Scott. No. Uh, don't, don't do it. Uh, don't I'm, do it. I'm, don't play I'm, I'm, don't play it's with A. It. A. Don't play really? With really? Please don't play with him. Like, like, really? Like what? Like what? You just, like what? You, you don't like, you ain't like the first name? <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny, man. When I graduated from law school, I, I changed from Alan Scott Bolden to A. Scott Bolden. My mother, before she passed away, said, boy, I didn't name you that. Your first name, Alan, you, know, you ain't proud of your first name. <laughs> See, right there, right it's there, so right, right, sustain. <laughs> you, you, you bet your mama about to become an ancestor going, that's some bullshit. Your name, <laughs> Alan, your name ain't Scott. It sounded more loyally, A. Scott Bowles. I bet you, right. I, I bet your mama cussed you out, and uh, some of her last bit. words were, "You full of shit. Your name Allen. <laughs> Ain't no damn Scott." See, I'm with your mama, man. Y'all, man, y'all black people, yeah, just so bougie, <laughs> so bougie. That's a true story too. That's right. A true story. You see, you walking your ass around Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> Hi, I'm A. Scott Bolden. <laughs>
Hi, I'm A. <laughs> Scott Bowen. It has a nice ring to it. You have to admit. Yes. Hi. Very nice ring. Hello, how are you? I'm A. Scott Bolden. Yes. And when I wear my ascot, it really sounds better. It like, looks better. Uh, like, I'm A. <laughs> Scott, like, I'm A. Scott Bolden. And then, then you got somebody who went to Mohawk. Man, his punk ass name, Alan. His ass ain't no A. <laughs> Scott. All right, I got to go. All right, Rebecca Scott, appreciate it. Too. Yes, yes. A. Scott, thank you so much. <laughs> For being on the show. Okay. Rebecca, defend me. You're just sitting there listening. Yes, you're bougie I mean, ass. It's, it's, it's rarefied air. I mean, we say <laughs> it sounds very rarefied. Yes, yes. We so those of <laughs> you know, we book Rollins pay you a compliment. We book the boo oh, yeah. we book the bougie Negroes on the show. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we well, do. We, we have something to say too. Oh. No, you, no, you don't. All right. Wait. No, before you go. No, you don't. Hold on. Before you go, your argument with me and Robert on on Tim Scott. I've been doing this show for about five years, seven years. When 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 the bill, when the George Floyd bill was being argued, you argued the direct opposite. No, I didn't. You go back and look at your video. No, I didn't. You blame the Biden administration for not doing no, more. No, no, actually, I actually, you're in, no, actually, now no, you just no, actually, see, and not Biden. see, here's now the whole deal. Go back see, video. see, here, see, 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 here, here's always the mistake. Here's always the mistake when you talk to an alpha. First of all, don't reopen a can of whip ass. I'm gonna do it. Cause then, I'm a, cause, I'm cause see, I'm cause see. I'm gonna look myself. No, no, no. Actually, I'm what you actually and what I'm, you I'm asking sick. me to do? Put what, on social media. No, what you, you are, what you yeah. asking me to do is go get a folding chair for your ass. That's what you asking me to do. <laughs> I'm telling you, I remember those conversations. Here, here is well, here we, here is what. I said what I oh, what what I pull, said was when it was, when, when it was in the house I said the Biden administration should be as aggressive on the George Floyd Justice Act as they were when it came to the 300 meetings with the infrastructure exactly. bill. I, excuse me, I'm not done yet. Then it passed the house. Then it went to the Senate. I know for a fact because I talked to the people who were sitting at the table when Senator Tim Scott and Senator Lindsey Graham promised the families and they said, we are going to get I remember that. Excuse, I remember the eight that. votes. Monique Presley was sitting there with Ben Crump and others. And what then happened was they were going through the various negotiations and they were making, they were making progress. Two of the three law enforcement organizations were standing yes. with them, including the Fraternal Order Police. What, yep. Tim, what Tim Scott did was, there was a sheriff, a notorious sheriff in South Carolina who heads the State Sheriff's Association. He got him to send a letter criticizing it, and he used that as the basis for saying, we can't move forward. And then he went on Face the Nation and told Margaret Brennan that the Democrats want to defund the police, and he said, quote, that was a bridge gone too far. Even though a year earlier, based upon a story from Mac Michael Harrod in The Root, Tim Scott, in his own bill, said, if you don't pass these measures, you can't apply for the money. That yeah. is what has happened. Well, so, we, I don't think me and Robert disagree with anything you said. Uh, what we disagree with you was, instead of blaming Tim Scott, you should blame Tim Scott and the Biden administration for I not doing enough to again, get that bill done. That I can't, I can't, let me be perfectly clear. When two Republican senators look family members in the eye and say, we are going to get the eight additional Republican votes. That was a quote. Then I am blaming, I, I am blaming the very people who failed to do that. And Senator Tim Scott did not even call those family members after talks broke down and he has yet to talk to them okay. more than a year later. I made that, my point. Those are facts. I made my point. And yes, Let's and you have been and right. you have been corrected okay. for the second time. I'll see you next so week. Roland, so Roland, so Roland, so Roland, can I can I say something here? Go ahead. So look, for the average voter, they don't understand that nuance. And one thing that I will say That's why they should watch the show. Uh, 
They absolutely should. All of us can agree that Donald Trump is an existential threat to black Americans. He's an existential threat to Americans, period. I think that's something that all of us can agree on. I think we can also say that there is a lot that the Biden-Harris administration has done that's been positive for black communities in America, but they also need to message it better, and they need to lead with that and talk about it more. That is a, it, it, that is a separate conversation than what actually happened. I agree on messaging. I agree on articulating what you did and what you accomplished and how certain things failed. But I will assign blame where blame should be rightfully assigned. And again, Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott, Republicans from South Carolina, looked those families in the eye and said, we are going to get the eight Republican votes. And we don't not. disagree with you. So, we don't disagree with that. I just think your blame should be broader. But anyway, let's get out of here. And, it's time for you to say and to And to clarify, 60 is needed to end debate, i.e., to bring about closure, and you only need 50 plus one to actually pass a bill into law. So and, I just want to clarify and that. And you need 50 plus one, and when you have Cinnamon and Manchin standing there, you only got 48. Facts. Okay. All right. Got it. There you got go. It. So, you got schooled twice, Scott. All right, folks, that's it. Folks, if you have hit the you hit, hit, hit the, um, uh, the like button on YouTube, do so. Please do so. Also, support us in what we do. Download the Black Sun Network app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You, of course, also can support us by with your contribution by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Send a check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 200 Seven dash zero one nine six cash app dollar sign rm unfiltered paypal or martin unfiltered venmo is rm unfiltered zale rolling at rolling s martin.com rolling at rolling martin unfiltered.com and get a copy of my book white fear how the brownie of america is making white folks lose their minds download the audio version on audible get your copy on amazon barnes and noble books a million target folks that's it that's it i'll see you tomorrow right here on rolling martin unfiltered on the black star network Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rolling. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?